Hey guys. This is part 6 of what if Naruto was Luffy's sister. Hit like and subscribe if you like this one and also please check the author in the description. Let's start. We are pain, that's all. We are God. <laughs> Chapter 21, Fishman Island 4 Staring at the screen in front of her, Nera's face darkened, along with Hyde. Especially when they just witnessed two of their Yuza citizens being shot right before their eyes. Their hearts were in flames, but they still kept a calm facade even though they just wanted to go over there and teach Hodi a lesson for not only disrespecting their nation, but also injuring their citizens. Hey, he's calling for us, Nachan. Luffy pointed at the guy on the screen. Who is he? Hody. Jean Bay gritted his teeth. He's really trying to destroy this island. I didn't expect that he would attack this soon. Hyde scowled. What are we going to do now, Nehru? Nehru didn't answer him, but she turned her gaze away from the screen and stared at the massive sea serpent that hadn't stopped staring at her ever since it had revealed itself. She heard what Hody had declared earlier and she didn't doubt his words at all. Nero wasn't worried about Hody because honestly, Hyde and Jinbei alone would be enough to handle him. Even her clones could handle him as easily as kicking a random pebble on the road. But she did care about the people. There were also her citizens here, not to mention that there were also humans among them. Fishmen and mare folks could swim away to save themselves, but for humans, there was a higher possibility that they would die once the bubble burst. Even though Nair was strong, she too wouldn't be able to stay underwater for too long. Not to mention those devil fruit users. Therefore, her top priority was the island's safety first. Which meant that the sea serpent and its minions, the sea beasts, were a bigger threat to her than Hody. Let's go and beat him up. Luffy pumped his fists together, causing Nair to stare at him in disapproval. Are you always this reckless? She scolded him. You're nineteen years old this year and you're still this reckless? How could you suggest we just go and beat him up after he threatened you with everyone's safety? You listen to me, Luffy blah 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 blah. Jean Bay and Hyde stood quietly on the sideline as they stared at the young man who lowered his head as he listened to his older sisters scolding like a good kid. If the Straw Hats were here to see their captain being scolded for his recklessness and still listened obediently without interrupting, they... Especially Nami and Usopp would surely beg this one Isama to stay with them for the rest of their journey. Once she was done scolding Luffy, the boy could only pout his lips and said sorry, like he always did. Heh, it seemed like nothing much had changed since their childhood years. Nerys shook her head at him. Listen, as a captain of a crew, you should be more responsible and stay out of any reckless actions that could spell doom to your entire crew. You see those sea beasts? He nodded, unconsciously licking his lips as he stared at them. If he was on the surface, those would be his food by now. You can beat them, I know you can. But before you could do that, they would tear through this bubble and the whole island would be flooded with the sea water. And when that happens, you can't do anything about that because you can't even swim to save yourself or your crew. Get that? It was rare for Luffy to listen to someone's explanation seriously or even pay attention to someone's talking for more than a minute. But he always did listen to his sister. No matter how much time had passed, he couldn't change the habit of listening to his older siblings. Especially his older sister right here. So he listened to her words seriously, and thought of the scenario. He frowned when he realized the truthfulness of her words. Whenever he faced the kind of situation where he would end up in the ocean, he could always depend on Zoro. Sanji and even Usopp for most of the time to fish him out of the water. But he too knew that this time, Zoro and Sanji wouldn't be able to do much if they didn't even have enough air for themselves. They were, after all, 10,000 meters below sea level. It would be an end game and a guaranteed death the moment the bubble burst. Luffy's style was always the one that do first, and think later instead of think before doing something. But contrary to what his crew thought of him, Luffy could actually think seriously and analyze his situation pretty well. He just didn't do so because he trusted his crew enough to get out of trouble. Or because he was simply having too much fun and forgot about the problems. But now that the situation didn't really seem to be in their favor, 
Luffy had to think of what to do to get himself out of this situation. How to beat Hody before he could destroy the island? Could they beat him before he did that? But what if he ordered the sea beasts to attack the island the moment they arrived? There was also that sea serpent that made his sister acting out of character just a moment ago. Thinking and thinking, Luffy shook his head, hard. Arg. Why is thinking so hard? It really isn't that hard to think you know. Hyde sweat dropped. Ho? Luffy Quinn seems to be more mature than he was two years ago. Jean Bay nodded in approval. As for Nehru, she weighed down the pros and cons of their situation, before coming to a decision. You three listen well. At the Ryugu Palace. Seeing the bloody scene through the projector, King Neptune and the princes, along with the ministers were in despair. They were aware that the outlaws had been showing up around the island recently. Some had even been caught trying to break into the island illegally. But who would have known that great disaster would befall on the kingdom today? Shirohoshi's eyes glued on the bloody scene as tears started to form at the corner of her eyes when two innocent people had been shot. The sound of the gunshot kept ringing in her ears, and her body trembled in fright as she stared at the person who was grinning with such a twisted and evil look on his face. It was the expression that she remembered quite well from a distant memory. She started sniffling and eventually cried as her tears dropped to the floor, splashing the nearby straw hats in the process. Her crying won a place in Sanji's heart, and he immediately went to her side to comfort her. Don't worry, Sure Hoshi-chan. I won't let that bastard get near you. What? Who's this guy? Zoro scowled, clearly not the least bit bothered by Hody's presence. The only thing that grabbed his full attention was when he called out for Luffy and Neru. Does he want to fight? That is Hody Jones. He used to be a member of the Neptune army a few years ago. And now he is the captain of the new Fishman Pirates. One of the ministers explained briefly. Nami frowned when she heard that, and flinched when she noticed that familiar tattoo that used to be on her shoulder, branded on Hody's left arm. Our long tattoo! But he's attacking the island now. Isn't this a rebellion? Usopp questioned. Usopp's words only put a damper on their spirits, even though he wasn't wrong. Hody's action was clear to see that he was rebelling against the kingdom. He seems to have a grudge with Luffy and Neru or something. Zoro gripped his swords. I'll say we go over there and I'll cut him myself. Usopp smacked him. Idiot! Can't you see those scary sea beasts outside? If you do that, those monsters will attack the island. Usopp is right. Hody seems to have the ability to command them to attack the island any time he wants. Once he does it, we who can't breathe underwater could only struggle for air as we slowly drown to death. Robin said with a straight face. Robin, that's scary! Chopper and Brooke cried out. They were devil fruit users all right. Forget about swimming, they couldn't even stay afloat. His action as he shot two innocent people without any hesitation also shows exactly how merciless he could be. I'm afraid he would kill more people if we didn't comply with his demands. She added as she looked pointedly at King Neptune. Her words were clear. If none of the Ryugu family members, Luffy or Nehru showed up, they were afraid that more victims would fall under Hody's merciless act. Or worse, the island itself would cease to exist like he had claimed. The bubble itself wouldn't be able to handle more than 100 sea monsters tearing through it. King Neptune was in further distress with her words. He was, after all, the ruler of this kingdom and the entire island fell under his protection. He was responsible for the safety and well-being of his people. Hence, as he thought of his position and responsibility, he didn't hesitate to make a quick decision on the spot. Then I shall go ahead, Jaman. Father! Your Majesty! King Neptune's resolution to go and see the enemy alone caused a commotion among his children and the ministers. If you're going, then we shall follow you. Fukuboshi declared, his two brothers nodded their heads in agreement. Even the sobbing Shirohoshi stopped her crying as her eyes shone with the same fire as her brothers, not wanting to be left behind. We, we are family. I am also a princess of this kingdom. So, I will share the burden with father and brothers too. Shirohoshi. The four male members of the Ryugu family were stunned as they stared at her. But they didn't try to convince her to stop, in fact, 
they looked extremely proud of her. A month ago, she was still as timid as a baby fish who didn't even dare to do something as she was afraid of causing troubles for her family and the kingdom. But now look at her. She had grown so much. King Neptune felt like crying as he thought about his late queen and how proud she would be of their princess if she could see their daughter now. No, your majesty. The ministers disagreed. Doing so will only put you, the princes and princess, in a highly risky and dangerous situation. All of a sudden, King Neptune laughed heartily at them, confusing those in the room wondering if the king had finally gone crazy due to stress. Don't worry. I have faith that Neridano would be able to turn the tide to our side. She would not let this island fall just like that. With the mention of their greatest ally, the ministers quietened down immediately. Shirahoshi's face brightened with the mention of her friend's name. Father is right. Nerachan will be able to handle this. We just have to put our faith in her and believe that everything will be fine soon. With Princess Shirahoshi's words, the ministers finally let go of their worries completely. How could they forget that Fishman Island was now under the protection of the Yuzukage? With her on their side, they shouldn't worry too much. Didn't she and her brother get called out too? Then they surely wouldn't let anything happen to the royal family if they were at the same place. Hody was probably too full of himself for underestimating the two individuals that were considered a major threat by the world government. Neridano was a capable person, and they just had to trust her. Plus, two of her citizens had been shot. As a ruler herself, she surely wouldn't let Hody get away with that. A while after that, King Neptune stood in the middle with his children on each of his side. All of them held the imposing aura befitting of their royal identities. Even the timid Shirahoshi appeared to be very charismatic as she stood together with her family. Just as when they were about to leave, the straw hats unexpectedly moved together with them. Seeing the questioning look thrown at them, Nami winked that Hodi called out to our captain, right? Zoro touched his swords and Sanji smirked. It means that he is also calling out for the whole crew to come. Hell like hell we're going to let Luffy get all the fun without us. Erg I think I have the can't go to the plaza disease. Usopp claimed weakly but he still went along with them anyway. This will be interesting. Robin smiled. Wah. Just wait and see my new babies in action. Frankie struck a pose, and Chopper cheered on his shoulder. Luffy-san, wait for us. King Neptune and his family looked at the straw hats with admiration in their eyes, and thought this pirate crew was nothing like their bad reputations at all. At the plaza, nobody made a sound. Not the citizens, not the pirates, and not even Hody himself. All he did was grinning smugly as he enjoyed the look of fear in the eyes of the citizens. Even those from his crew didn't dare to meet him in the eyes, and just quietly guarding the hostages. Captain, they're finally here. Hamad reported next to him. I can see my darling Shirahoshi from here deck and grinned to himself as he rubbed his hands together in glee. Time passed, and King Neptune finally appeared together with his children, along with the members of the Straw Hats crew. The fact that the Ryugu family came alone with the Straw Hats crew was a clear picture to everyone that they didn't come here to fight. Despite their appearance, Hody appeared less than satisfied. Why? It was because the two humans that he wanted to crush the most were nowhere to be seen. The just-arrived group was surrounded by some of the new fishman pirates as they pointed their weapons at them. They were forced to move to the center of the plaza where everyone could see them. With everyone's focus on them, nobody noticed any stealthy movements around them. These people were the elite force that belonged to the Neptune army. Earlier, they were ordered to blend in with the crowd and stay vigilant until further notice. With a glance, they looked like any other civilian with a trace of panic and fear on their faces, but their eyes said the opposite. Yuhu! Shirahoshi, my love Deccan winked at the object of his obsession. Noticing Deccan's inappropriate glances at Shirahoshi, the three princes moved their sister away from Deccan's sight. They sneered at him but the fishman only laughed and blew imaginary kisses to the mermaid princess who avoided it in disgust. What is this? Hody looked at the straw hats. Did your captain run away? They glared at him. Zoro was about to throw a sharp remark back, only for him to be silenced by Nami's glare. Considering that they weren't the only one involved in this troublesome situation, 
Zoro rolled his eyes and held back his tongue. For now. Nami, as someone who was quite familiar with being threatened with her village's freedom for years, stared at Hody with a hidden disdain in her eyes. Don't you worry. Our captain is anything but a coward. Hody merely smirked at her words before turning his attention to Olypius and Kinana. And what should I do with the two of you? It seems that your beloved Yuzukage is not as great as what you thought. Perhaps. Has she already thought of abandoning her people and now refused to come? The people of Yuzuk glared at him. One of them bravely defended Neru. Our Nerusama will definitely come. Someone like you will never be able to strike fear into her heart. Hody's veins bulged when he heard the guy's words, but he still maintained the smirk on his face. Then he laughed at them. Then I'll be nice and give some more time for those two to show themselves. King Neptune frowned. Why are you doing this? I remember that you were once a part of the Neptune army. Hody sneered at him in response. Ah, the traitor has spoken. What were you even thinking of allying yourself with a human? Just spit out the truth. You're selling the whole fishman race to the humans, aren't you? What nonsense are you speaking, Juman? Humph. Don't play ignorant. We all know that you're in cahoot with them, and now in the process of handing over the kingdom to the humans. The alliance is just a fraud. Once she take all of you to the surface, all of you will be treated like a slave. This so-called alliance is nothing but a trap to deceive our people, you brainless fools. Hody's words caused the people of Yuzu to frown. Stop saying nonsense. Narasama treated us well. Olypius shouted. His face was red due to the anger in his heart. Even with his wounds, no signs of pain could be seen on his face. Yeah. We're the living proof that not all humans are bad. The citizens of Yuzu treated us equally, and if it weren't for Narasama, we would certainly be dead a long time ago. Exactly. You're just trying to ruin the alliance. Don't think we couldn't figure out your intention, Hody. Because of the Yuzu people defending their savior, those who were originally saved by Neru and were sent back to the Fishman Island also spoke up on her behalf. Them defending Neru also meant that they were defending humans and supporting the alliance. More and more of them through their encouragement and good opinions, causing the Ryugu family to be glowing with pride. For a moment they forgot that their lives were held by the enemy that could kill them any time if he was displeased. Hody's face turned dark when his plan to cause a discord among the royal family and the citizens went backward and now more of them supported the alliance. Hody thought that with some tricks and lies, he would be able to destroy the trust between them and make them disagree with the alliance. But what he didn't know was that, everyone on the island never did forget about the painstaking efforts and sacrifices made by the late queen to ensure a better future for themselves. Combined with the efforts of the Ryugu family who carried on the will of the queen for all these years, and the lives of their brothers and sisters who were living peacefully on the surface in Yuzu with humans, those in Fishman Island wished for nothing but a harmonious and peaceful life above the ocean surface too. Hence, whatever tricks or lies that Hody wanted to use to cause a conflict between them would never happen. Shirahoshi, marry me, and you shall be spared. Dekken suddenly spoke. What did you say, you bastard? Sanji fumed with a raised knuckle. How could someone as ugly as him could demand a beautiful sea goddess like Shirahoshi-chan to marry him? That was simply too horrible for her. No, Shirahoshi refused loudly much to everyone's surprise. I've waited for a decade. I gave you a lot of attention, didn't I? Then why don't you want to marry me? The rejected Dekken demanded angrily. The Ryugu family was infuriated by Dekken's shameless declaration of love. Launching a bunch of weapons of all kinds was what he considered giving her a lot of attention. He was the reason why Shirahoshi had to be isolated in a lonely tower for years. Shirahoshi lowered her dazzling eyes to the ground, sending a small peek at the fuming Dekken before saying you're just. Not my type. You're just. Not my type. Not my type. Not her type. He was not her type. The princess's words kept repeating in everyone's head like a broken tape. Y-H-H-H? That's it. That's the reason? It's not because you were scared of him but because he's just not your type. Usopp voiced out everyone's question incredulously. 
her family stared at her in disbelief. Even Hody and his crew looked at her with a raised eyebrow. Hmm. Sure Hoshi nodded her head without hesitation. Why you? Dekken pointed a shaky finger at her. Fine. You asked for it. Out of anger, he snatched the weapons that belonged to the new fishman pirates around him, and continuously threw them all to the direction of the mermaid princess. Princess. Shirahoshi Chan. Look out. Everyone held their breath as those weapons flew towards her. But much to everyone's surprise and relief, the straw hats that stood together with the Ryugu family immediately took action. At once, those weapons were easily blocked by the straw hats. Some were being cut in half, some were being kicked away, some were being caught by a net made of arms, some bounced away, and some even exploded. Under everyone's stare, the straw hats crew protected Princess Shirahoshi with their own ways. But one flying axe bypassed them, and almost hit Shirahoshi when it suddenly went still in the middle of the air. A ripple was formed where the axe was, before it dropped to the ground with a loud clang. King Neptune and those who were aware of Shirahoshi's protective barrier sighed in relief. Thank goodness for the barrier. Even though they knew that the barrier provided by Neridano was quite effective, they still couldn't help but to be worried. So that's it. That must be that cursed woman's fault. Dekken cursed under his breath. Angered, he glared hatefully at Shirahoshi. Mad, he looked at the silent Hodi and grumbled I'll make sure to make her regret this humiliation. Then he left for somewhere else. Hodi just let him be. He knew where he was going, and what he was about to do. And so he didn't make any attempt to stop him at all. He only stared at the straw hats with complete dissatisfaction. You dared to raise your weapons? He bared his sharp teeth at them. I told you to behave, or else someone's gonna get hurt. Hody then raised his gun again and was about to shoot another victim to prove his words, when King Neptune's voice stopped him. Wait. Everyone stared at King Neptune, wondering what he was going to do, while Fukuboshi suddenly felt anxious. You can have me, but please spare the people, Juman. Father. Fukuboshi tried to protest, but King Neptune raised his hand and shook his head. His message was clear, do not interfere. The next thing they knew, King Neptune was captured and chained right next to Hody. The reason why he was willing to let himself be treated this way was to prevent Hody from lashing out on another innocent person. He knew by doing this, he could very well end up dead today, but for some reasons, King Neptune felt that there was nothing for him to be afraid of. Heh. Hody smirked as he looked at the pathetic state of King Neptune. Then his smirk slowly turned into a huge twisted smile, scaring away those who saw it and wondering what was going on in his crazy head now. Including Shirahoshi who immediately trembled upon seeing it. Since it has already come to this, let me tell you a well-kept secret about your beloved Queen Odoheim's death. Everyone went stiff at the sudden mention of the late queen. What was Hody trying to do now? Every Fishman Island resident including those from Yuzu and the new Fishman pirates, knew about the horrible fate that had befallen the late queen. She was the one who was trying so hard to make a better future for the kingdom, convincing everyone to have a good relationship with humans. But in the end, a human shot her to death. Everyone knew that. What are you trying to say? Fukuboshi demanded. Everyone stared at Hody in anticipation, wondering what he was going to say. The silence was killing them from the inside as Hody took his own sweet time before opening his mouth. The words that flowed out of his mouth as he confessed killing the late queen himself was like a slap to all of them, especially the Ryugu family. Hody told them everything, from his ambitions, his hatred for humans, and his manipulation against the pirate to cause a riot. Then he took the advantage among the chaos and shot Queen Otoheim himself. He disclosed everything not leaving a single detail out. Ah ha 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 ha. Wasn't she stupid? A lying with humans? What a joke. What an annoyance. She was such a bother, right, Shirahoshi? He stared at the mermaid princess in anticipation, trying to provoke her. Saying that taking revenge against humans was bad, crying all over the island about getting close to humans. It was so aggravating to see her at it all the time. Instead of getting a certain reaction from her, it was the people around her that were angered. 
How dare you? Don't talk to Princess Shirahoshi like that. Hodi. King Neptune was truly angered by Hodi's words. The expression on his face went taut with fury. Not only did he lose his wife, his children lost their mother, and the people lost their queen. Back then he held back his hatred and anger, and even locked himself away just so he wouldn't destroy Odoheim's dream. At some point in his life, he hated humans so much to the point where he didn't even want to have anything to do with them anymore. But he buried his anger, hatred and bitterness, and they had been eventually replaced by the acceptance of his wife's death, and his willingness to accept humans once again. All for the sake of his wife's dream. For his children and for the future of Fishman Island. He truly believed that his wife's killer was a human. But the truth was that the criminal was one of his own people. Hody, you bastard! How dare you! King Neptune's eyes turned red with anger, as he struggled to free himself in order to beat up Hody himself. He regretted that he didn't do something to this bastard in the beginning. But Hody, who was waiting for this moment, immediately fired multiple shots of water bullets at the giant merman much to everyone's surprise. The citizens panicked and even Hody's crew didn't expect their captain to do such a thing. Father, the princes cried out. They too appeared to be greatly shaken over what they just heard. They wanted to go over their father's side, but one look from him caused them to stay rooted on their spots. Hody looked at the silent Shirahoshi who hadn't uttered a single word ever since he exposed the truth behind her mother's death. It was me who killed that annoying woman. I still remember the feeling of satisfaction that I felt when I pulled the trigger. Jahahaha. Hodi laughed, further making them angry. It was inevitable that she was going to die. That's why I killed her. It was all me. Shirahoshi's lips trembled as her tears gathered at the corner of her eyes. Her chest tightened when she saw the condition of her father bleeding on the ground, devastated. Shirahoshi-chan. Sanji carefully called out to her but the mermaid ignored him. Or she just didn't hear him. I already knew. The words escaped her lips softly. Shirahoshi? You. You knew? King Neptune was stunned, as well as everyone else. How could that be? What do you mean that you knew that I was the one who killed your mother, Shirahoshi? Hodi demanded. Shirahoshi lowered her gaze to the ground. Because I saw it. He then why didn't you say anything, Shirahoshi? Fukuboshi asked in disbelief. If I said? She suddenly raised her voice, startling everyone. If I said it, then people would surely hold a resentment towards Hodi. And that would make Mother sad. Princess. Shirahoshi shook her head and continued, I promised Mother on her deathbed that whoever the killer was, no matter where he was from, I shouldn't bear any hatred against them. Hearing what she said, her brother stared at her in pure disbelief. Unconsciously, the last words from their mother rang in their heads. Whoever did this, no matter where they might be, do not feel anger or hatred for my behalf. For ten years, you obeyed mother's wish? All alone in that lonely tower, Fukuboshi said with a pained look. You are such a fool. Jahahaha. Hodi laughed as though he just heard the greatest joke someone had ever made. Oh, sure, Shoshi, if only you confessed and actually told someone of what you saw that day, your father and these poor people wouldn't have to be in this state right now. All of you here would still be laughing and enjoying your peaceful life just like any other day, if Princess here wasn't so stupid and naive to actually hide the truth. Shirahoshi bowed her head as she continued to cry. But thanks to your stupidity, everyone here will die, and the island shall perish. It is all thanks to you, Shirahoshi. You are the main reason for the destruction of your own kingdom. You have no one else to blame but yourself, Shirahoshi. Jahahaha. Hick. Hi. I'm sorry for being selfish. Shirahoshi hiccuped as she rubbed her eyes. That's not true. Fukuboshi argued back. You did nothing wrong, Shirahoshi. Mother will be so proud of what you did. All of us are. You are truly the most gentle child with the purest heart. What you did was never wrong. He's right. King Neptune shouted with a shaky voice. Oh, his poor daughter. There is nothing wrong with what you did, my child. Jahahaha, what else would it be but wrong? 
Hody laughed harder at his words as he raised his palm and without any warning, he struck the siblings with multiple water bullets like he did with King Neptune. Because the princes were in front of the crying Shirahoshi, they had their backs against the enemies. And when they realized the situation, it was already too late when all three of them were hit on their back. It was so sudden that not even the straw hats were able to react in time. No. King Neptune struggled, but only to get hit by Hody again. Father. Brothers. As most of the people screamed out in horror, even Shirahoshi who was crying at her brother's side, Usopp and Chopper trembled in fright as they commented how scary and cruel Hody was. Even people like Soro, Robin and Frankie frowned as they stared at the wicked Hody in disdain. Nami had a dark look on her face as she clenched her fists. This situation only reminded her of her childhood. It was like she was Shirahoshi who was crying over her mother's dead body. What a scum. Satisfied, Hodi said now we shall just wait for. They are here. Dosa suddenly pointed to the sky, instantly cutting off his boss's words. Indeed right there, a huge shark with a bubble tube around its body appeared to be floating towards them. There seemed to be a total of four individuals right on top of it. Shirahoshi broke into a huge smile, obviously happy and relieved upon seeing them. It's Megalo. And he brought Nerachan and the others too. Luffy is here. That's Boss Jinbei. Megalo stopped right above the plaza, and the four of them jumped off his back before landing in the middle, standing between Fukuboshi's group and Hody with the chained King Neptune in front of them. With the appearance of their four new guests, things started to change. The previously depressing and somber mood had been swept away. The straw hats smirked at Luffy, thinking to themselves that with their unpredictable captain here, a fight would surely break out any time soon. Not only the pair of siblings who were wanted the most by Hody showed up, even Boss Jean Bay did. Not that they didn't know that he stayed at the sea forest, but that guy rarely left the place if it weren't for King Neptune's order sometimes. And even though Hyde was also quite known among the people of Fishman Island, that guy was nothing in Hody's eyes. He could care less about the extra guy, but Jinbei's appearance was quite unexpected. I didn't expect another traitor like you would be here too, Jinbei. He looked at Jinbei, only to be ignored as the blue fishman was more worried about King Neptune and the three princes' current condition. Your Majesty, are you okay? He didn't expect that things would be like this so soon. While Jean Bay was worrying over the siblings, Luffy waved at his crew. Hiya, guys. Luffy, you're late. Nami merely said. Shishishishi, shi, 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 sorry, sorry. Nera spared a quick glance at the Ryugu family and her two injured citizens, before analyzing the current situation. With her sharp observation, she immediately noticed the familiar elite forces that were hidden among the captured citizens. In her heart, she praised their quick actions. She took a step forward and stared directly into Hody's eyes. So you're Hody, huh? Well, we are finally here as you wanted. So please refrain yourself from being unreasonable. Such an attitude is not good, you know? By that, she meant his bad temper. Some of them gasped at her boldness. Is she trying to provoke him? Usopp whispered nervously to Nami. How dare you speak to Captain Hody like that, you wench? One of them and Hody's crew cursed at her, only to whimper when he was met with the chilling cold gazes from the wench. Even though they were finally here, Hody wasn't pleased. He didn't like the way she stared at him and the way she spoke to him. It made him think that she was looking down on him. It also didn't help that Jean Bay, too, didn't even glance at him from the moment he arrived. Such disrespect. Dissatisfied, he delivered a strong water shot to their direction, only to get blocked by the same attack by Jean Bay who stood in front of the group protectively. What do you think you're doing? Hody gritted his teeth. You don't actually expect us to stay still while being attacked, right? Nero rolled her eyes. It seems that he is really an impatient man. Jean Bay commented. Hmm. Very impatient. Luffy agreed, posing next to his sister. That is to be expected of someone like him. Hyde shrugged his shoulders. Watching the four of them dissing Hody like he was nothing, the new fishman pirates were getting nervous. How could they not? Captain Hody was getting mad. Do you even know your situation right now? He asked. 
Yes. Nera looked at Luffy. What about you, Luffy? Luffy pumped his fists. Hell yeah. I'm going to kick his ass. You can't just say it so boldly like that. Some of them scolded him. Such arrogance is very admirable. He is dead now. That Luffy. Nami glared at his back. Hody's face went red with their words. How dared they embarrass him like that? He never felt so humiliated in his whole life. Despite being the one who was in control, they still dared to look down on him. You humans still dare to act like the superior one here? Once the bubble is destroyed and no more air here, I would like to see how arrogant you pathetic beings can be. There will be no more hope for you after this. You can act all high and mighty on the surface but here, you're hopeless. Once I command those sea monsters to attack, then it's the end for all of you. At this, the beasts outside growled. Everyone was disheartened by Hody's claim, because they knew that he spoke nothing but the truth. Nerechan. Shirahoshi softly muttered under her breath, worried for her friend. Naren narrowed her eyes at Hody, so you're really going to use those sea monsters outside to bring down this island? Hody scoffed at her. Do humans have little intelligence? That's what I'm aiming for. TCH, enough talk. It's time to end this. He raised his blade and was about to land a strike on the chained King Neptune, only for a sudden gust of wind to hit his body, causing him to loosen his grip on the blade and let it fall to the ground with a loud clang. Seeing that it was narrow with her palm open at him, he was enraged. You! Do you really want to risk everyone's lives here with your stupidity? Not the least bit affected by his outburst, Nero calmly declared I will handle those sea beasts outside. What? Are you stupid? How can a puny human like you stop more than a hundred sea beasts on your own? You can't even breathe underwater. Ignoring him, Nero looked at Luffy and the rest and simply said I trust all of you to handle the situation here. While everybody else was trying to make sense with her words, Luffy merely gave her a thumb up. Don't worry, Nechan. You can count on us. Satisfied with what she heard, she then exchanged a knowing look with Hyde and Jean Bay, before suddenly disappearing into a poof of smoke, leaving behind a dumbfounded crowd. Back to the sea forest was the real Nehru. The one that went with Luffy, Jean Bay, and Hyde earlier was a clone all along. Nehru was standing on the edge of the reef with the sea serpent's face right in front of her. Only the wall of the bubble separated them. The reason why she had her clone to replace her was because she believed that this huge sea serpent was the real threat, and even more dangerous than Hody himself. Even though she figured out that this sea king listened to Hody's whistling, it didn't exactly look forced to follow him. If Hody could make it come out of the darkness by a simple whistle, then once he whistled again, she was afraid that the sea serpent would immediately attack the island without hesitation. Someone like Hody, Nera knew the best. Hence, why she made a clone to make Hody lower his guard. As long as he believed that he was the best and that everything and everyone was within his control, he would start to be overconfident in himself, and would eventually lower his guard, thinking that he had already won. She was confident that Luffy and the others would be able to handle the matters at the plaza on their own. They didn't need her, and she would like to see how much her little brother had improved for all these years. Plus, she wouldn't let him or the rest handle something that they couldn't handle. While the clone was still at the plaza, Nehru was having her own staring contest with the sea serpent. Its body was very long, and covered with hard dark green scales. Its eyes were narrowed upwards and it also had yellow fins near its gills and on its back. It actually looked like an ancient dragon with a long, slim body, but without the limbs. More like a snake but with a dragon head. Very fascinating. You sure you don't want to come out, Kurama? And get my fur wet? No thanks, you handle this yourself. You sure it wasn't because you're afraid of losing to this big guy here? She teased him, only to receive a growl in response. Suddenly, she received a flash of memories from her clone. Not wasting any more time, Nera took out a weird-looking plant from her storage seal and put it inside her mouth. She grimaced and complained about the strong and bitter taste of the plant as she took off her orange outer dress, revealing a black short and a black tank top underneath. She took off her boots and braced herself. Well then, here goes nothing. 
The next thing that happened was beyond anyone's expectation. She jumped off the reef and went through the bubble, successfully out of the island and now facing the sea serpent with a determined look. She grinned at the sea serpent, and Golden Chakra covered her whole body from head to toe as she released her own killing intent. Come. And the sea serpent opened its mouth. Chapter 22, Fishman Island V. Nera's sudden disappearance caused a ruckus at the plaza. What just happened? Where did she go? As everyone erupted into a frenzy, wondering how and where the Yuzukage had disappeared to, Zoro's eye twinkled with a knowing gleam as he smirked to himself. He had already figured out the situation on his own. The heck you're smirking for, you damn moss head? Narasan is gone. Hey, you wouldn't understand. Zoro responded with a smug look that, in Sanji's opinion, was very annoying to look at. Just as when the annoyed Sanji was about to deliver a kick to wipe out that stupid look on the swordsman's face, they heard Usopp who suddenly gasped. Hey, look at those beasts. They're retreating. Usopp exclaimed loudly, dragging everyone's attention to the situation outside of the island. True to the sniper's words, those sea beasts that had been guarding around the island as they waited for Hody's order to raid the island just now, suddenly retreated in a hurry, much to everyone's confusion. That's impossible. How could this happen? Hody hissed. Even his subordinates weren't able to give an answer as they too had no clue of what was going on. Look! Narasama is over there! Someone cried out. There, outside the island, was the person that just vanished into a smoke before their eyes just a moment ago, was now facing the humongous sea serpent on her own. She was covered in a bright golden light from head to toe. And despite the lack of a bubble suit or helmet to provide any air for her, she didn't look like she was struggling, nor was she showing any sign of having any difficulty in breathing at all. Actually, she looked like she was so ready to fight the sea serpent head on. And just right then, they watched anxiously as the sea serpent opened its mouth wide and suddenly charged forward, obviously trying to eat her in one go. But what she did next surprised everyone when she raised her arm and the golden light immediately expanded into a giant arm that grabbed the sea serpent's head before pushing it away from the island. Because of that, the Fishman Island was now out of danger of being destroyed by hundreds of sea beasts and that frightening sea king. Nice Nachan, Luffy cheered. What the heck? What's going on? How could she look perfectly fine there? How did she even end up there when she was just here a moment ago? Nami asked, surprised with what just happened. Hyde with his handsome face, glanced at her with a smirk as he explained there's actually a special type of plant that could give a person the ability to breathe underwater. But the plant is extremely rare and hard to find. You'll need extreme luck just to find one. Interesting. I assume that she is now breathing underwater due to that plant? Robin asked, amazement shown in her eyes. But only for a short amount of time. Hyde added with a small frown. Which means that she needs to beat that monster before her time runs out. Outrageous. Hody snapped when he heard what Hyde had said. He curled his upper lip in disdain as he took a glance at the glowing Neru. A human that is imitating the ability of a fish man? What a joke. This only shows that fishmen are more superior than humans. We're the one that should stand above them. We. Sending everyone a glare, he continued now they're taking over our special ability. Later they will take over our entire race. That's enough, Hody. Jinbei's voice boomed, cutting him off instantly. He looked at Hody disapprovingly. Give up on whatever it is that you're trying to do. No matter what you said, the alliance between the Fishman Island and Yuzu will never be broken. This is a step to a better future for us and our future generations. Jinbei. Giving him a sneer, Hody started to accuse him. You sure are being so friendly with humans now. I can't stand a fool like you the most. TCH. Even though Fisher Tiger and your sworn brother Arlong that grew up together with you in Fishman District were killed by humans. You actually sided with the perpetrators instead of taking vengeance. You are just a cowardly fool that is even lower than Neptune. Arlong? Nami frowned once she heard that familiar name. Oh, you. Don't talk about Jean Bay like that. Luffy shouted at Hody. He was obviously displeased at the way Hody disregarded his friend like that. 
especially doing so in front of him. It's fine, Luffy Kun. Jean Bei placed his hand on Luffy's shoulder, before looking at Hody again. Your hatred has blinded your eyes and blackened your heart. You can put all the blame on me, but the others are innocent. As long as we're here, whether it's Narasan, Luffy Kuen and his crew, the Ryugu family, and everyone else. As long as we're all united, humans or fishmen, we shall stand together and rise together. Jinbei. Jinbei continued that is why, your treacherous plan will never succeed as long as we're united. And we will never let this kingdom to perish by your hand just like that. Queen Odoheim's will shall live on, our dreams shall come true, and there's nothing that you can do to stop us. As long as there is light, there is hope. Boss Jinbei. One of the captured people sobbed as everyone else was getting teary at Jinbei's words. Boss Jinbei is right. There is still hope for our people, for our kingdom. Queen Odoheim's will shall live on. Jinbei. King Neptune who was still bleeding on the ground looked at him in gratitude. Pride overwhelmed him as he listened to his people chanting about hope and how his dear queen would bless them for a better future. Jinbei's words had certainly reached the deepest part of their hearts. Not just the residents of the Fishman Island, but even those in Hody's crew had started to waver and now looked uncertain around them to the point they unconsciously started to lower their weapons. But those who had stayed in the crew since the beginning started to become anxious. They stole a quick glance at their captain and gulped nervously. Hody's face was as dark as the deepest part of the sea. They knew that expression very well. Someone was definitely going to get hurt. And just then, someone screamed out in pain, and blood spilled on the ground, silencing everyone at once. A mermaid was shot, and the culprit was Hody himself who had just attacked an innocent citizen with a water bullet yet again. That bastard! Sanji glared dangerously at Hody and was about to go over there and kick him himself if it wasn't for Usopp who was holding him back. Stop it, Sanji. If you go out now, another person will get hurt. Usopp tried to calm him down. That is a warning, Hody stated calmly. Don't forget that everyone here is still under my control. Dream? Will? What kind of stupid joke was that? All of you fools can't even look at the bigger picture and refuse to accept reality. Well then, look at this. Look at your pathetic king. Look. With a crazy expression, Hody stomped his feet on the bleeding wounds of poor King Neptune repeatedly, causing his injuries to be worsened. Stop it! Shirohoshi begged with tears running down her face as her brothers had to hold her back from going over there and get herself killed. You're hurting him. That's the whole point, princess. Hody said sarcastically at her before he looked around with a mocking gaze. Don't forget that I still have hundreds of thousands of people under my command. That stupid woman may be able to fend off the rest of my sea beasts. But would she be able to live long enough against the sea serpent to save all of you? We shall see. Then Hody lifted the blade on the ground with his feet before he grabbed it with his hand, and swung it downwards with a murderous glint in his eyes. Let's start with you, Neptune. Father. No. But before the blade could even reach King Neptune, Hody's figure suddenly vanished from their views, and a loud crashing sound was heard as the captain of the new fishman pirates crashed violently into the wall behind him, destroying it instantly. Silence befallen them. Nobody dared to say a word as they all stared in disbelief at the sight of Straw Hat Luffy who was now standing right next to King Neptune and that strangely long arm which was now returning back to its normal length. He. He just punched Captain Hody. Someone broke the silence. This would be Hody's second failed attempt in trying to execute King Neptune on the spot. Luffy Quinn? Jinbei gawked at Luffy. He talked too much, said Luffy as he shrugged his shoulders, while his crew either smirked or shook their heads at his words, not even the least bit surprised with what he had done. It was just a matter of time, actually. They were more surprised that Luffy managed to hold on to until now. Shirohoshi's glistening eyes gazed at Luffy's back. Somehow, he gave off the same comforting presence that she often felt from Neru. The same presence that she also used to feel from her late mother. The feeling of being protected. Just like how she trusted Neru with her life, Shirohoshi felt like she could also put her trust in Luffy. It made her want to believe that everything would be fine. 
While the others were still gaping, the monster trio looked intensely at the spot where Hody was currently at. Despite not being able to see him, they could feel a sudden surge of power. What was going on? He really did that. Zio gasped. What about Captain Hody? As if on cue, a deep and sinister laughter was heard as Hody's figure slowly emerged from under the rumbles. Everyone gaped at what they saw. How could they not? Hody suddenly changed into a new person. His appearance seemed to have changed a lot. His shirt was torn, showing them his bulging muscles that seemed to grow in just a short amount of time. His skin and hair turned white, and his eyes turned red. All in all, he looked completely different from what they had seen a few moments ago. Even his previously round stomach had changed into those abs. See, Captain? It looks like he already consumed those pills, Hayazo said. He and the rest were taken aback by his transformations, though. The last time they knew, the energy steroids didn't give such an ability to the user. Was it because Hody took too much? Very good, Straw Hat Luffy. Hody said with a complete madness on his face. You fools really didn't value your lives. With veins bulging across his neck, he commanded attack. Kill them all. As soon as those words escaped from his mouth, Hyde immediately took action by clouding the whole plaza with his mist, giving the sign to the hidden elite forces to come out of their hiding spots and proceeded to protect the civilians from harm. Protect the civilians! Jinbei commanded as he led the elite forces and the Neptune army who just arrived into the battle. Kill! Even though there were some who hesitated, they eventually followed the order and attacked. Between Jinbei's warm-hearted speech and Hody's cruelty, they were more afraid of Hody. Amidst the chaos, Luffy stepped up, ready to face his opponent. But, Luffy Quinn, Shirohoshi's voice stopped him on his track. P please, protect the island. Please defeat Hody. Luffy didn't respond to her words for a while. Slowly, he put his hand on top of his head and revealed a wide grin. You don't have to tell me that. Because that's what I'm gonna do. With that, Luffy went ahead to face Hody. That Luffy really? Nami muttered under her breath, but she already had her climb attacked out and ready in her hand while Zoro cut off the chains around King Neptune as Shirahoshi and her brothers immediately went to their father's side. Hyde looked at King Neptune. I'm sorry, Your Majesty, but it's better if all of you evacuate with the rest of the people first and leave the matters here for us to handle. The people's safety is our top priority. I understand, Juman. King Neptune nodded. About Neradeno. No need to worry about her, she can handle her own battle. Hyde assured him. As most of the straw hats were eager to join the battle, Hyde warned them next. Make sure to deal with them as fast as you can, and for your sake, do not stay exposed in the mist for a longer period of time. Without trying to elaborate more on what he said, Hyde disappeared into the mist, leaving no trace of him. Well, you guys heard that guy. We can't just let Luffy take all the fun, Zoro said. Wado Ikemanji was already placed between his teeth with both of his hands holding onto Shu Sui and Sandai Kitetsu. TCH, we don't need you to tell us that. Sanji lit a cigarette. All right, you guys, go. And what are you standing behind Frankie for? Nami! Leaving the other matters to the others, Luffy went to confront Hody who was busy glaring daggers at him. If Luke could kill, Luffy would have been dead a hundred times by now. As soon as Hody commanded his crew to attack, the battle had already started. The area turned misty, making it a little bit harder to see things. The sounds of people roaring and screaming were accompanied by the sounds of weapons clashing and explosions. Only these two hadn't started a move yet and just stood across each other, challenging one another with their own aura and presence. While Luffy was calm, Hody was vexed. He didn't like the fact that Luffy was still able to keep a calm facade even in his presence. This human was the one who managed to take down Arlong a couple of years ago, which he found quite laughable. Despite being someone that he used to admire when he was a kid, Hody thought that Arlong was nothing much, and also a disgrace to the whole fishman race just because he was defeated by a single human. Wanting to surpass Arlong, and thinking that he was better than him, Hody took it upon himself to be the one who would finish off the thing that Arlong had failed to do. 
To kill Straw Hat Luffy. I actually heard a lot about you. Hody started. A measly little pirate that was able to cause the downfall of the entire Arlong pirates. You sure are capable, huh? But unfortunately for you, I'm on a completely different level than Arlong. Just you and your tiny crew alone is not enough to go against my new fishman pirates. Seeing that Luffy gave zero reaction to what he said, caused him to be on another level of being annoyed. Even so, Hody continued, trying to provoke him. Once I kill you, I will kill the rest of your crew. Soon after that, the Ryugu family shall be executed right in front of everyone as I take over the throne and change the kingdom. As Hody was spitting more of what he would do, Luffy started to get impatient. Just as when he was about to just go ahead and beat Hody, his ears perked up when he heard what Hody said next. I will be the pirate king and rule the entire world. Jahahaha. Pirate king. And by the time comes, everyone shall kneel and bow down to me. What do you say? Should I spare you until the day comes? Maybe I should be nice and spare your sister too. At this, Hody grinned wickedly with an unknown gleam in his eyes. Facing the sea serpent alone is the biggest mistake of her life. Not to mention that she is underwater, even with the help of that stupid plant, she has no chance to survive against that sea serpent alone. Should I spare her too? If she wants, I could let her be my woman too. A perfect female human as my slave sounds very nice, don't you think so? Jahahaha. What? Did you say? With a dark look, Luffy gave him a cold look, startling Hody when he felt the sudden decrease in temperature. Taking a step forward, Luffy said Hody was it? You see, I was told to beat you up as soon as possible. As he spoke, Luffy didn't stop walking further. Hody unconsciously about to take a step backwards once he felt a sudden chill down his back, but he forced himself to stay on his spot. Why should he be afraid of one pathetic human? Let me clarify one thing. The front of his hat dropped down slightly, causing a shadow to cover his eyes. You can be whatever kind of king that you want, I don't care. But, the title of the pirate king, is mine. Suddenly, a force escaped his body, causing the fog around them to be dissipated. Hody was shocked when he was exposed to a sudden burst of power from Luffy. He was even more shocked when the boy suddenly vanished from where he was, only to reappear right in front of him in a blink of an eye. Hody immediately crossed his arms to block the incoming punch. The punch felt even greater than when he was punched away for trying to kill King Neptune before. But since he already consumed several pills of energy steroids at once, his strength doubled, and so was his durability. So even though Luffy's punch was strong, it didn't do much to affect him. Knowing this, Luffy remained calm. Even when Hody too managed to land several punches and kicks on his body. Luffy didn't feel any pain due to his body being a rubber itself. Blunt attacks wouldn't be enough to hurt him. The two exchanged blows. Even though Hody had changed and became a lot stronger, Luffy was not someone who could be easily underestimated either. Hody realized that fact a little bit too late. If he was strong, Luffy was even stronger. If he was fast, Luffy was even faster. And worst of all, no matter how hard and lethal his attacks were, Luffy didn't suffer even a little bit due to the nature of his devil fruit. Even when he tried to use his fishman karate techniques against him, the younger man was just too fast. On the other hand, Luffy was able to cause an injury on his opponent, due to his ability in using hockey and of course, his own battle prowess. The thought that a human was actually better than him infuriated him so much that he wasn't able to focus on the fight properly. He thought that with the help of those energy steroids, he was already stronger than everyone here. But facing Luffy certainly crushed his beliefs. Meanwhile Luffy, who was in his second gear mode, certainly wouldn't let himself get beaten so easily by a guy who only relied on some pills to boost his strength. His pride, and his two years of hard work wouldn't let him lose to a cheater. And because he was the one who wanted to fight Hody in the first place, to prove that he was actually getting stronger, Luffy refused to get outdone by his opponent. Because of their foggy surrounding, and that the mist itself was no ordinary mist, both Luffy and Hody were experiencing some odd things at the same time. What's wrong with my eyes? Is this the side effect of consuming too much of those pills? 
Hody wondered as he was trying to find the current whereabouts of his enemy. Then, he felt something grabbed onto his shoulders. Next thing he knew, something hard knocked into his forehead. The force and impact behind that attack was the hardest strike he had ever felt so far. It was so strong it sent him crashing through the wall, landing himself out of the vicinity of the plaza. Hody landed harshly, and blood ran through his head. Small sharp rocks impaled his body, but he didn't look like he was even aware of that. Sprawling on his back, Hody was breathing heavily. This is not enough. With bloodshot eyes, Hody slowly stood up and wordlessly grabbed a fistful of energy steroid. This time, it doubled the amount that he took before. But before he could even shove them into his mouth, his grin disappeared when a shadow loomed over him, and something hard landed harshly in the middle of his gut, where he received continuous solid punches all over his body, including his face. The pills dropped from his grip and scattered around them. Some of them had been crushed underneath Luffy's fast and merciless Gatling gun. When Hody saw the now-crushed pills, he was so mad his veins were about to burst. But he couldn't even drag himself away from Luffy's seemingly endless punches. He was just too strong. Hody could only lay there pathetically as Luffy pummeling him ruthlessly. All of his punches were brutal. No matter how much power that he had gotten from consuming a bunch of energy steroids earlier, the borrowed energy that he gained from them couldn't even be compared to the real strength of his opponent that came from his own hard work. Just as when he really thought that he was going to die, Luffy stopped. But he didn't stop completely. Hody's heart dropped to his stomach when he watched the younger man suddenly put his thumb in his mouth, and his fist suddenly grew like a balloon and completely covered in black. With a loud battle cry, Luffy used his elephant gun to finish off the one-sided battle. With that last strike, Luffy finally got off him. And when he did, Hody's figure was almost unrecognizable. It wasn't just because of his earlier transformation, but also because of all of those beating that he had received from Luffy. It could be said that Luffy really didn't hold back his strength against him. If it wasn't because of the slide up and down of his chest, Luffy would have thought that he was dead. There was a brief silence between them before it was broken by Luffy. Uh? Hody twitched when he heard Luffy's cold voice. Since he couldn't even move a muscle at the moment, he could only shift his gaze and stare at Luffy with his eyes flashed with resentment. Like I said, the only one will become the Pirate King. Is me. Cool. Hody coughed off blood. Despite the pain, he forced himself to open his mouth. So you just went mad, just because of that? You see crazy bastard. Luffy's eyes hardened at what he heard. Just that? Hody flinched when he was met with Luffy's cold gaze, expecting another attack from him. But instead of another punch, Luffy only stared down at him for a whole minute without doing anything else. The longer he stared, the more anxious Hody was. The feeling of death coming for him was so strong at this point. Is he really going to kill me? Hody thought nervously. Luffy moved, and Hody unconsciously closed his eyes. But he felt nothing. When he opened his eyes, the only thing that greeted him was his hated enemy's back, much to his confusion. You can claim to be the Pirate King, that's fine. I can beat you up for it, Luffy said as he walked further away from his beaten opponent. But nobody is allowed to insult my family and friends, and get away with it. Hody stayed silent as he stared at Luffy's back. He was unwilling to accept this. The resentment that he had in his heart grew even more as he thought about the humiliation that he faced. His confidence and arrogance were utterly crushed just like that by a human of all things. No. He refused to accept this humiliating defeat just like that. Not like this. Heart in flame, he forced his muscles to work and took out an object that miraculously survived from the pouch that he wore around his waist. A beautiful silver conch came into sight and with a crazed look, he blew. Arg. A man fell down, unconscious. Another one down. Hyde grinned, as he knocked down the enemies one by one. He could hear the panicked screams of his enemies as the effect of his mist was starting to kick in. I can't see. That's weird, I'm losing my strength. Thud, someone dropped to the ground. Why can't I hear anything? Why is it getting blurry around here? H help. 
any a. Uh, Handling a group of more than a thousand people alone was an easy task for Hyde with his devil fruit abilities. Hyde wasn't the type to fight head on with his enemies like Nero with her godlike powers, or Yuzu with her excellent swordsmanship, or even Barlow with his monstrous strength. No, Hyde was the type to fight with the element of surprise. As in, beating his enemies when they least expected it. By the time he became one with the mist, he had been sneaking around knocking his enemies unconscious and saving some people while he was at it. As for those who were screaming about being unable to see, hear or suddenly getting weaker as they dropped to the ground like a rag doll for no reason, it was just his devil fruit doing its job. He didn't even need to beat them himself. That was this task was very easy to be done for someone like him. Earlier, it was Nera's plan to let herself handle the sea serpent, while Hyde, G. Bay, and that baby brother of hers returned to the plaza with her clone to stall for some time. Hyde wasn't sure how the younger woman planned to handle the sea serpent alone, but Hyde didn't doubt her ability. G. Bay was entrusted to lead the Neptune army and protect the civilians as Hyde dealt with the minions while Luffy would go ahead and face Hody himself. Even though G. Bay was considered as a criminal due to his pirate identity, he was also a respected and trusted person by not just King Neptune alone, but also by the entire kingdom. Hence, him leading the army. By the time he was finished, he cleared out all of the mist and saw that the battle more or less had already ended. Even Luffy had finished his battle with Hody, and now joined the rest of his crew as they watched the ongoing battle outside of the island. They were also joined by the rest of the Ryugu family and the citizens. Hyde whistled when he saw the savage way Nero was handling the sea serpent. Ho? Oh, I know she could change her appearance, but that? I didn't know she could do that either. At the straw hat side, Luffy and his crew watched the battle with either shock, disbelief, interest, and amazement written all over their faces. Is that really Nero-san? Jinbei asked in surprise. Usopp was horrified with what he saw. Luffy, your sister is a monster. A real monster. What kind of devil fruit gives such an ability? And even if she ate that special plant, she shouldn't be able to do that. Nami cried out. Even though it was hard to believe what she saw, she couldn't help but to have a high respect for Nero. After all, it wasn't every day a woman could transform into a huge sea monster the same size as a sea king and bravely fought it underwater with the risky chance of being drowned to death once her time was up. Luffy looked at Nami as if she was a clueless little child. But that's not Nei-chan. Huh? What do you mean? Instead of answering her, Luffy hummed a melody. He hummed cheerfully, making the others wonder what he was trying to accomplish. Not until he reached a certain note that he stopped. Aha. I remember. That's Gyuki, the Hachibi. Hachibi? It kinda sounds like Kyubi. Hyde, who just arrived on their side, chuckled at his words. That's your older sister all right. But that. Didn't she tell you that she's a ninja? As a ninja... Of course she would be able to change her appearance. Luffy beamed with realization while Usopp and Chopper's eyes shone at the mention of that. Ni ninja? A transformation? Cool. Back to a few moments ago after Nera's clone had dispelled itself in front of everyone. As soon as she jumped out of the island, Nera released her killing intent that was mixed with Karama's chakra as she activated her QB chakra mode. The other sea beasts were intimidated into submission and hastily retreated far away as they felt a sudden domineering aura coming from the small human. Crushed by a suffocating presence, those pirates that had been riding on the back of the sea beasts had long been unconscious and now had fallen to the ocean floor. Nera didn't have time to worry about them. But as for the sea serpent, even when its pupils shifted slightly, it didn't show any reaction to her presence. As she expected, this one was the biggest threat. As soon as the word come escaped from her mouth, it was as though the sea serpent could understand her because it immediately opened its mouth wide, revealing a set of sharp teeth and charged towards her. But Nero, who had prepared herself, merely raised her arm and a giant chakra arm was formed that quickly grabbed the sea serpent's head and roughly pushed it away from her with great strength. The longer the chakra arm was, the farther the sea serpent was pushed away by her the farther the better, she thought. She didn't want to implicate the Fishman Island by accident. 
but despite the distance, those on the island could still see them. It was because of the frightening size of the sea serpent and the eye-catching Nehru who was covered in golden light. Once the sea serpent was far enough, Nehru dragged her body to it with the help of her long chakra arm that still had its grip on the sea serpent's head. After that, she removed the chakra arm and readied herself for its upcoming attack any time soon. But weirdly enough, the sea serpent didn't even try to make a move at all. The strange creature just stayed at the spot where she pushed it and stared at her with a judgmental gaze. Yes, that darn seeking was really looking at her with a judging gaze that she was so familiar with. Recalling what had happened earlier, Nehru removed her gaze away from its eyes to its snot. It would be troublesome if she suddenly got hypnotized again. Nehru looked at its snot, and it looked at her. Nehru wondered if she should just beat it up and be done with it because she just couldn't stand the way it stared at her. What the heck are you staring at me for? The sea serpent suddenly looked surprised. Human, you can talk to me? Nehru. Fascinating. I was actually wondering how a tiny human like you was able to possess the same aura as him. A deep unfamiliar voice that she heard earlier, ringing in her head, startling her for good. Nera looked at the sea serpent in surprise. You. She responded back inside of her head, the same way she always used to communicate with her bijou partner. It has been a long time since a human was able to communicate with me. I am quite surprised. It said as it moved its snake-like body and swam lazily in a circular motion around her. I'm the one who's surprised that a seeking could communicate with me. She replied with a guarded look. She didn't know if it was because of Karama or something else, but she was honestly surprised that she could communicate with a seeking. The other person that she knew who had the ability to communicate with a seeking was Shirahoshi alone. It was one of the things that the young mermaid had told her before. And now that she observed this seeking carefully, she realized that the nasty feeling that she felt from it earlier had long gone, replaced by a sudden feeling of calmness. The sea serpent's words from earlier got her thinking. What do you mean I have the same aura as him? Who is this person that you were referring to? The turtle. It simply said. Her heart gave a sudden lurch. A vague thought flew across her mind, but it was too fast for her to grasp its significance. Hence, she brushed it off and focused on the sea serpent. You. Don't seem to be so bad. Why are you even following someone like Hody? Because she was in her QB chakra mode, her sensitivity to evil feelings was doubled and knew instantly that this big fellow didn't have any ill intention at the moment. It didn't seem to be the type of a weak creature that would allow itself to be ordered around by a mere fish man that could be eaten by it in one go. So Nero was wondering why it ended up in this situation. I owed him. It answered. Okay, she didn't expect that. The sea serpent continued. My life was saved by him once. As a gratitude, I shall grant one of his wishes. Nera blinked her eyes at it. So you're repaying his favor by attacking an island full of innocent lives out of the goodness of your heart. I cannot break my words. Listening to its reasoning, Nera felt like grabbing her hair out of frustration. Sighing in her heart. Nera deactivated her mode as she confirmed that this fellow wasn't actually that bad, and it was just having an unfortunate luck for being used by another person for personal gain. Also, there wasn't any reason for her to use such a high-level ability against an originally good-natured creature that was only doing what it was told to do as a form of gratitude, no matter how ridiculous it sounded to her ears. Nera got the feeling that this fellow was actually quite gullible. Maybe if she tried to convince it to leave Hody's side, they wouldn't have to fight after all. And this matter would then be settled peacefully without the use of violence. How nice would that be? But unfortunately, it wouldn't end up like how she thought. Nero was taken aback when the sea serpent suddenly flinched. The fins on its back suddenly stood upright as its glowing green eyes turned bright red. The sea serpent growled dangerously at her. The growl reminded her of the kind of growl that came from a predator that was about to attack. What's wrong? She tried to reach out to it, but all she got in response was a sudden attempt to eat her. Luckily, she was able to react just in time and moved her body out of the way. The calmness that she felt from it was gone instantly as it was replaced by the nasty feeling that she felt earlier. She was too perplexed by the sudden change of nature 
and the aggressiveness shown by the sea serpent that she found it difficult to keep up with its movements. There must be something that caused it to be like this. She thought as she barely managed to evade its sharp claws. It must be Hody who did this. Swoosh. Nero was hit by the sea serpent's tail that was covered with hard scales. The force of its tail was so strong it made her gasp in surprise, only for her to end up swallowing a mouthful of salty sea water, making her frown at the taste. Damn it! It's hard to move around like this. To say that she had no problem moving around in the water would be a lie. First, this was her first time fighting underwater, especially in the deep sea. Second, to compare her size with the sea serpent alone, she was as small as a bean next to it. Third, the sea serpent was a local resident in the sea and it had a big and long body that was suitable to smoothly move around in the water, unlike her. Not to mention, her hesitation to hurt this fellow as she originally intended to before she knew that this good-natured sea king was only being used and controlled by Hody. And she didn't even know any water-based ninjutsu that could be useful in her situation. Even if she used her chakra mode like earlier, it probably wouldn't do much since she still couldn't move as swiftly as she wanted to. Not having much of an option, Nehru instinctively chose to transform herself into a more suitable body so that she could move better in the water. Her choice? An octopus came into her mind. In an instant, a huge creature replaced her figure. The creature was as big as the sea serpent with the head of an ox, and a muscular body with two muscular arms. The lower part of its body consisted of eight tentacles. With a glance, it looked like an octopus, but at the same time it didn't. This creature was exactly the Hachibi, Gyuki. Kurama, who was observing everything silently in the seal, had conflicted feelings when his Jinchuriki turned into the Hachibi. Whatever he thought at the moment, only he knew. As soon as Nera changed her appearance, she delivered a strong punch right to the jaw of the sea serpent who came rushing towards her as soon as it realized what was going on. Despite the strong punch, the sea serpent proved itself to be quite durable as it quickly recovered in no time and went to attack Nera once again. This time, instead of trying to swallow her, it used its strong tail to attack her body. Every swing of its tail proved to be strong enough to destroy a half part of the island. Added to the fact that its body was naturally strong, Nera didn't have it easy either. Her henge wasn't the typical low-ranked genjutsu level that was taught and used by most of the shinobi from her memories. Her transformation was actually solid. But it also required a huge amount of chakra for her to stay in that transformation. So whenever she was struck by the sea serpent, Nera had to pour more chakra to make her henge more steady as she fought back with a punch or two. Another whip of its tail and instead of letting herself get hit, she grabbed its tail with both of her hands and held it in a tight grip. The sea serpent reacted by struggling to free itself, and when it failed to escape from Nera's tight hold, it made a spin and tried to bite the back of her neck. Only for Nera to suddenly pull its tail, spun it around multiple times, before throwing it away. Due to the spin, the sea serpent appeared to be a little bit dizzy as it shook its head. But then, it suddenly went still yet again. Nero, who was ready for another round, looked in confusion as the sea serpent who didn't move. What was it now? What was it doing? She became more confused and surprised when it suddenly raised its head, but instead of looking at her, it was looking straight at the island behind her. Suddenly, Nero had a bad premonition. Before she could think of the reason for her uneasiness, the sea serpent proceeded to swim upwards, right above the island. Its figure was getting smaller and smaller as the distance grew. As expected of a creature that lived under the sea, in just a short moment, it already managed to reach quite a distance between it and the Fishman Island. Looking at the sea serpent and the island several times, Nero widened her eyes in disbelief. Don't tell me. Cursing and scolding Hody in her heart, as she was sure that the guy must be the reason for the sea serpent's unexpected action. Nero swam as fast as she could and reached the top of the island in no time. She floated right above the island in a protective stance. With her sharp eyes, she watched as the sea serpent finally stopped swimming once it reached a certain distance, and without even waiting for a moment, it dived down right into her direction. Or to be exact, the island underneath her. Nero gritted her teeth. She was right. 
It really was trying to destroy the whole island with its body. Having no choice, Nera sent a silent apology to the Sea King for what she was about to do. Opening her mouth, just like what she had done before, she created a Bijudama that was only half of its real strength before launching it without any hesitation to the direction of the incoming sea serpent. She was trying to stop it, not kill it. Even with half of its original strength, the Bijudama was launched as strongly as it could before it hit the right side of the sea serpent's body. The sea serpent released a terrifying cry from the pain. But even so, it didn't stop itself from moving downwards. It was clear to see that the sea serpent didn't have the slightest intention to stop its suicidal approach at all. Damn it! Nera hardened her eyes before she surged her body upwards. If it couldn't be stopped, then she had to use force. With a high speed, the two monsters were getting closer and closer to each other. Just then. Boom! Their heads clashed, causing massive ripples that eventually evolved into angry waves from them. Not minding the pain, Nera took advantage of their collision and immediately wrapped her arms and tentacles around the sea serpent's body, immobilizing it on the spot. Chapter 23 Fishman Island The End When Vander Decken left the Fishman Island out of anger after being rejected and badly humiliated by Shirohoshi in front of everyone, he actually went back to the Fishman district where his whole crew was waiting for him. Once he arrived, he was greeted and informed by his crew that all of the preparations were done. Satisfied, he looked at the massive ship that was covered wholly by a bubble, just like how the Fishman Island was wrapped inside a massive bubble. You sure there's no water in there anymore? He asked cautiously. He was a devil fruit user after all. Imagine being a Fishman but had a weakness against seawater just because he ate a weird fruit one day. Truly sucks. Absolutely, Captain. Good. He stepped into the bubble as his bubble suit burst, and immediately took off the glove that had been covering his right hand for most of the time. He looked at his right hand that was completely bared, and a scowl appeared on his face. He used this hand to throw many weapons at the direction of the mermaid princess as a sign of affection only to be rejected by her just because he wasn't her type. Didn't it mean that she already had someone she loved who wasn't him? That was unacceptable. That was a total betrayal. If I can have you, then no one else can, he declared. Then he touched the ship with his bare right hand. The ship moved. At the same time, at the Fishman Island, Everyone was stumped and rendered speechless at the sight of the two monsters battling at the top of the island. The violent movements coming from the two caused the island to be swayed from time to time. They were exactly right above them for God's sake. Nachan is so cool. Luffy cheered, rooting for his sister to win. Heh, not bad. Zoro grinned. He couldn't help but to feel his blood boiling and his heart beating furiously due to the excitement as he watched the battle. Oh, how he wished he could join the battle as well. Um, Hyde-san? Are you really sure that's Luffy's older sister and not a real monster? Usopp pointed his trembling finger at the two massive monsters trying to overpower each other with their own brute strength. Hyde's face was also a little bit pale. How could he not? He had known his friend for more than ten years, but this was actually the first time he had seen her fighting in a form like this. A form of a monster no less. And apparently, according to Luffy, she was copying a form of a monster that was supposed to have some sort of a connection to Karama, the Kyubi. Not like he knew exactly the origin of the fox or anything about him other that he actually wasn't made of flesh and blood and currently residing within the body of his friend. It also didn't help that Nera didn't tell much of her past life before they met. Making a mental note to ask her more about her transformation ability, and not to piss her off for no reason in the future, he coughed a little bit and responded to the long-nosed sniper. Why, yeah. I assure you, that is indeed our narrow all right. Though I am also as surprised as you are. Scary. I thought my heart was about to burst out of my chest. Brooks sighed in relief as he patted his chest area with his bony hand. But I don't have a heart anymore. Yahohoho. ho Ignoring Brooks' trademark laugh in the background, Nami shuddered and hugged herself as she replayed the scene of the sea serpent diving straight to the island with its mouth wide opened. W.L., at least we're safe now. True. 
Imagine if the sea serpent actually crashed into the island, the bubble would have burst, and we would all be drowned to death with no hope to survive. Or all of us would end up being eaten alive by it. What if all of us combined are not even enough to satisfy its appetite? Robin asked with a straight face, scaring the cowards with her words. Robin! Don't say that! Usopp and Nami yelled at her together. Scary! That's scary, Robin! Chopper hugged her leg with tears running down his furry face. Don't worry, Robin San. Nami Swan. I will protect both of you ladies with my own strength. Sanji swooned his way to the women's side. What strength? Zoro couldn't help but to scoff at him, causing the blonde man to explode and the two fought as Nami yelled at them to cut it out while Luffy was busy laughing at them in amusement. Weya! What a manly fight! I am so touched! Frankie bawled his eyes out as he watched the battle of the two sea monsters as if he was watching a touching soap opera instead of a battle that could determine the fate of their lives. Hyde sweat drop at the sight of the Straw Hats crew's antics. He didn't know if they were being serious or just being funny, but he had to admit that they were quite interesting. Don't be celebrating too early. Jinbei broke their bubble. Remember what Hyde Sen said? Time is limited for Narasan. At his words, everyone turned to look at Hyde who blinked at the sudden attention that he got. Yeah, Jean Bay is right. Her ability to breathe underwater should stop working any time soon. Then it is better for her to finish off the sea serpent right now before her time is up, or else she would drown before she even gets the chance to return back to the island. With her current condition, the chance of her coming back here alive is close to none if she still isn't done with the sea serpent sooner. Robin said bluntly. Oi, you're being too blunt there. Usopp whispered harshly at her. That person was still a family to their captain. At least say it nicely. Shishishishi. Don't worry, guys. Nachan will be just fine. Just watch. Said the forever supporting younger brother Luffy as he rubbed his nose with his index finger. Hyde and those who knew Nair personally, or at least knew of her reputation and strength, nodded in agreement. Yeah, she would be just fine. Meanwhile, on Nera's side. Contrary to what everyone believed. No, she wasn't doing fine at all. The sea serpent's strength was no joke indeed. Even someone like her was having a hard time trying to hold on to it. At first, it kept thrashing around trying to free itself from her grips. Later, when it realized that it couldn't escape from her iron-like grips, it changed its attempt from escaping to trying to bite off her neck. If it weren't for her muscular arms and those eight tails wrapping themselves around its long limbless body, Nero would have been dead by now. Those sharp teeth look scary enough to her okay. This guy is really stubborn. Nero cursed inside her head. Even with a wound on the side of its body, the sea serpent ignored the pain and still had an extra energy and strength to trash around violently. Karama, who never failed to listen to her thought only snorted at her as if he wasn't the least bit concerned over the safety of his own jinchuriki. If anything, he mostly disapproved of the way she handled the snake. Perhaps, living in peace in her new life for the past twenty-four years had lessened her shinobi's instinct. If this was the past, she would have blasted the snake away with an upgraded Odama Raisingan by now. She clearly didn't mind doing that to him in the past. TCH he just wished that she would just hurry up and throw away her compassion for the snake and finish off the battle right now. But of course, being his kind and soft-hearted Jinchuriki, she didn't want to hurt it and even wanted to save it. Him foolish. Just hurry up and end this. It's not like you still have that much time left. Even with the Hachibi's form, you still couldn't beat that snake? Hearing the obvious ridicule in his voice, a tick appeared on her forehead. However, she didn't make any comment to deny his words. Nera knew that he was displeased with the way she handled her fight at the moment, but she also knew that he was just being worried for her. To be honest, ending the battle now was not a mission impossible for her. But she was hesitant to hurt this fellow because her heart knew that it wasn't actually a bad creature. Plus, she was actually kind of curious about what the sea serpent had mentioned before it became aggressive. Fascinating. I was wondering how a tiny human like you could possess the same aura as him. That piqued her interest. She was curious as to who was he that the sea serpent mentioned before. 
Who and what was he? More importantly, what kind of aura was it talking about? As curious as she was about that, she was also worried. Karama was right when he said that she didn't have much time left. Ever since their bodies collided, her condition wasn't actually the best. Her chest was starting to get all stuffy, and she found it a little bit harder for her to breathe at the moment. Even the temporary gills that she had on the sides of her neck were getting smaller and almost closed. She knew that time was limited, but she didn't expect that time would be this short. Sighing in her heart, Nero was also unwilling to use the jutsus that she had in her arsenal against the sea serpent. Most of them were either destructive enough to kill it, or not suitable to be used in her current situation. But she was nearly at her limit now. What could she do? At this rate, her body would return back to normal as that of a normal human being. She might even stop breathing before she even knew it and drown before she could even do anything about this guy. And when it happened, the island and everyone on it would be doomed. Think, Nehru. Think. Because she was busy thinking of what she could do, the sea serpent slyly took advantage of her momentary distraction, whittling its body just enough to get its mouth closer to her flesh. Then it opened its mouth and bit off one of the arms that were wrapped around its neck. Feeling a sudden pain on her arm, Nera's reaction was to open her mouth and yell out in pain, but she forgot that she was currently underwater so she ended up swallowing another mouthful of salty sea water instead. She could even taste the small amount of blood that was mixed together with the water that she had swallowed. You little. Nera then used more force to hold it down and delivered quite a strong blow using a single tail to the side of its face as an act of revenge. Tightening her grips around the sea serpent again, the wound on her arm instantly healed as she poured more chakra to her entire body to make her transformation more stable. Just then, a passing thought flashed across her mind. Wait. That's it. Eyes widened in realization. Nehru immediately closed her eyes as she went into a concentration mode and focused on what she was about to do. With some memories playing in her head, she silently apologized to the sea serpent before transferring a great wave of raw chakra to its consciousness. Suddenly, the sea serpent went still for a few seconds before it let out a loud roar as if it was in pain, before its entire body went limp like a noodle in her embrace. And just like that, the sea serpent was knocked out and lost the battle. Nero blinked and stared dumbly at the unconscious sea serpent in her arms, and thought it actually worked. The thing that she just did was actually based on what Eno had said to her in her past life. She remembered when the drunk Yamanaka's heiress explained to the whole gang how her mind techniques actually worked. But since this was such a long forgotten piece of memory, Nero only remembered the part when Eno said something about transferring a huge amount of chakra to a victim's consciousness, which would cause the victim to faint in shock or something. Taking advantage of the sudden memory, Nero did exactly that. Well, it worked. What the sea serpent felt earlier was just a sudden intrusion to its subconscious mind that caused a sharp pain to its head, which probably triggered its nervous system at the same time and caused it to faint. Still bewildered by the fact that the battle had ended just like that, Nera suddenly felt a sharp pain in her chest and nervously thought oh no. Not wasting any more time, she took the knocked out sea serpent and brought it to the ocean floor. Once she placed it there, she was about to leave when her sharp eyes caught a glimpse of something on her left. Unconsciously, she looked over and what she saw caused her eyes to widen in surprise. That's... Just then, she choked on the water that went into her nostrils and she immediately cursed. Focusing on saving her life first, she took advantage of the Hachibi's form and swam away from there to the Fishman Island until she reached the main entrance. Passing through the main entrance, she continued to swim across the sea and when she finally reached the land part of the island, she jumped out of the water and cancelled her transformation as soon as she landed on the ground, clouding herself with smoke. Everyone kept their eyes on the tall and slim figure that had replaced the form of a massive sea king, and now had returned back to her original appearance, as she walked out of that smoke with water dripping from her body. Just a moment ago, they were all ready to attack when something big emerged from under the water. Then, realizing that it was only the Yuzukage who had returned after taking down the sea serpent, they relaxed their stances and lowered their weapons. That was close. Nera sighed and took a deep breath. Once she was done catching her breath, 
She placed a hand at the back of her head and laughed awkwardly when she noticed the numerous pair of eyes on her figure. When she saw King Neptune among the crowd, Nero was about to go to him and inform him of what she saw earlier but was interrupted when an excited Luffy and the relieved Shirahoshi went to approach her first. Nachan, that was so cool. You can transform into Hachibi. Luffy stood in front of her with that big D smile on his face as he stared at her with stars in his eyes. Nera thought that her little brother was so cute, she couldn't resist the urge to pat his head just like how she often did when they were younger. I'll show you a lot more cool things later on, Kay? She promised him, and he immediately cheered. Not later after that, Shirohoshi chimed in with a soft smile as she said, Nerachan, I am so glad that you're fine. Thank you, princess. That was a close call. For a moment, I really thought that you were about to drown there. That crazy Yuzu would never let me live or die in peace if she knew that you died under my watch or something. Hai joked as soon as he reached her side and handed her a towel that he had gotten from who nowhere. Taking the towel and draping it over her shoulders, she scowled at him, Did you really have that little faith in me? Hai just laughed in response, but she knew that the older man was actually concerned about her. Nero was right, because Hyde couldn't be happier when he saw that she was safe and sound with no injuries on her person. As strong as she was, even stronger than him, Hyde considered Nero to be his own younger sister figure that he wanted to protect. They may not be related to each other by blood, but they were family nonetheless. By the way, over there before she could even finish her words, she was interrupted by Sanji who noodle danced his way to her side. Nero San. I was so worried about you. But of course, I also have a strong faith in you that you will definitely not lose to a single ugly sea king. Sanji praised her with heart in his eyes as he drooled over her wet appearance, causing Hyde to be annoyed by the younger blonde's behavior. If Yuzu were to be here, Sanji would have been dead before he could even touch Nero. Between Yuzu and Hyde, Yuzu was actually the one who was more protective over Nero. Hyde didn't know why. But since Yuzu was Nero's first companion since she arrived in the Grand Line, he thought that might be the reason behind the woman's clingy behavior. Actually, if it wasn't for her being needed somewhere else, Yuzu would be the one to be here instead of him. Unlike Hyde, Nero wasn't annoyed with the way Sanji acted around her at all. In fact, she actually found him to be a lot more interesting to be around. But that was probably because his flirtatiousness actually reminded her a lot of Jiraiya, that arrow Sanin. After Sanji, Zoro came over and praised her for her fighting abilities and expressed his desire to fight her when she was in her monster form. Nero replied by saying that he'd die, in which he responded by laughing out loud. Again, it was Sanji who was getting jealous over their closeness, but he couldn't say anything to that because Nero-san and Moss Head were actually real childhood friends. Some people tried to talk to her again. But this time Nero apologized before she quickly made her way to King Neptune who stood silently at one spot with his sons. They actually wanted to go over and greet her themselves, but seeing that she was busy with the others, they remained at where they were. Nerodano, we're glad that you're able to return safely. King Neptune said with a cheerful smile on his face despite the bandages covering his body from head to tail. Yes, yes, but wait. Listen to me first. Nera took a deep breath after stopping them from saying something, worrying the Ryugu family, and those who finally realized that she was acting weird since then. Is there something wrong, Nera-san? Jean-Bei asked the question on behalf of everyone. With a grim look, she said I'm afraid that our problem is not over yet. What do you mean? An old ship is approaching, and it's coming right to us. Later. After dropping the bomb to the unsuspecting King Neptune, the ship that Nero saw earlier finally revealed itself to the rest of the people once it was close enough to be seen by them from the island. The people were shocked because the ship was precisely the national treasure called Noah. It was also a whole damn district coming at them. The Fishman District to be exact. While the clueless Straw Hats crew wondered how an entire massive ship was even able to move, the people of the Fishman Island only expressed their anger because they all knew who was the damn reason for this disaster. Vander Deck Ken. Knowing that he must have done this because of her rejection earlier, Shirahoshi started to feel guilty and didn't stop apologizing because everything that happened today was all because of her. Of course, nobody actually dared to blame her. 
Why would they even blame an innocent person for the things that weren't even her fault? Feeling that she needed to take responsibility anyway, she was ready to leave and lure the ship away from the island, only for her to be stopped by everyone, especially her family members who had disapproved of her reckless decision. She didn't stop there. Instead she tried once again to convince them to at least let her go out there and touch the ship so that it would stop. She spoke so confidently with such naivety, as she believed that the matter would really just end like that with a mere touch. It made people to be even more soft-hearted and sorry for the innocent princess. 1. Deccan was on board the ship with his whole crew. The moment she got close to the ship, she would only be captured by them. And 2. Even if she managed to stop it with a mere touch, it would only drop to the ocean floor. And when that happened, who knew how much damage it would get? The Ryugu family couldn't afford to see it get damaged at all. But they really couldn't blame the princess for being that naive and ignorant. Despite experiencing the horror of her mother's death at such a young age, she was, after all, still a young child back then. Even when she was told by her mother about the hatred between their race and the humans, the child naturally didn't understand much of the adult's words. Added to the fact that she grew up in a tower with only a shark as her only friend, and the overly excessive protections from her family so that she would always be safe and be away from any evil things like Deccan. So ya people really couldn't blame her for being like that. Out of King Neptune's children, she was the one with the least exposure to reality, or any worldly affairs. But Nera thought differently. In her eyes, Shirahoshi reminded her of a child that only wished to be useful and helpful to lessen the feeling of insecurities that she had in her heart. Being someone who was older than her current age, she treated Shirahoshi just like how an elder would treat a troubled child. With patience and understanding. When she first came to this island for the sole purpose of bringing the fishmen and merfolks that she saved back then to their home, she actually met a young Shirahoshi who was probably ten years old at that time. They only met due to formalities that needed to be done, but Nero remembered exactly how the young Shirahoshi looked back then. Lost and lonely. Because her family was too busy ruling the kingdom or training to be the heirs, Shirahoshi was often being left alone in her tower. It wasn't like she didn't know that her family loved her, but it was because they loved her too much that they overlooked the fact that she was also a person with her own feelings. And just like her brothers, she also needed to grow as a person with her own abilities. But years passed, she ended up being someone who was too timid, had low self-esteem, afraid to speak out her thoughts, and remained a weak soul. But in her eyes, Nera viewed Shirahoshi to be someone with a strong will. It was because the times that they had spent together in this one month, Nera had seen it with her own eyes how much Shirahoshi had bloomed. Others might not see or notice it, but Nera did. And because of that reason, Nera had already made her decision. Meanwhile, Shirahoshi was feeling down. Even when the tiny fluffy creature called Chopper tried to cheer her up with some stories from above, she wasn't as happy and excited as she usually did whenever Nera told her about the surface. In fact, she was still feeling troubled over the current problem, in which she still blamed herself for. Are you not feeling happy? Chopper asked. The doctor of the Straw Hats crew was sitting on the mermaid's palms. With the huge gap in their sizes, Chopper looked like he could be crushed easily if Shirahoshi decided to crush him with her hands. Of course, a gentle soul like her would never do that. Shirahoshi shook her head. No, I'm feeling fine. Oh, okay then. The innocent Chopper believed in her poorly made lie and continued to tell her more about his life with someone called Doctorine followed by a description of what exactly this snow felt and tasted like. She was a little bit intrigued by that, but she was distracted when Nero, who was already dry enough to tie her long hair into a high ponytail, came towards them. Nero san Chopper exclaimed first with a big smile on his face as jumped down from the mermaid's palms. The way he stared at her was like staring at someone he idolized. How could he not? Luffy's sister was also a monster like him. Hello, Chopper. Nero lowered her body a little bit to pat the fluffy creature on his head. She also didn't forget to give him some compliments while she was at it. She remembered Luffy said that the reindeer liked to get complimented. Thank you for accompanying Shirahoshi here. That's kind of you. Just just because you compliment me, doesn't mean I like it, you bastard. 
Nara just laughed at his antics before requesting him to leave her and Shirahoshi alone so that they could talk, which Chopper immediately complied to. Once he left, Nara looked at Shirahoshi and asked how do you feel? Shirahoshi was about to say that she was fine, just like how she lied to Chopper a moment ago, but when she was stared by the calming gaze of her friend, the word stuck in her throat. Struggling, in the end she could only say, not fine. With Shirahoshi originally staying at a place where she could easily hide her big-sized figure, there was nobody around them except for some Neptune soldiers guarding around the place. Even so, they were far enough to not be able to hear anything or see them clearly. And so, the princess pouted her lips and her eyes were getting teary as she revealed her true feelings to Neru. Despite looking like this, the tears didn't fall. Neither of them said anything. Neru didn't try to strike a conversation either. Silently, she sat beside the mermaid, bringing her knees to her chest and rested her arms on them as she leaned her back on Shirahoshi's side. You know. Nara started, looking up to see the upper view of the Fishman Island. I used to have a gentle friend. And she used to be somewhat similar to you. With her words, Shirahoshi looked down at the small figure on her side, seemingly interested to listen more. Despite being an heiress to a powerful family, she was weak. She had no confidence in herself, and she had no courage to speak up. Even though she had the same ability like the rest of her family, she failed to use them as she was expected to. She was so kind. Too kind and too gentle to hurt someone. And maybe because of that reason that she was being regarded as being too weak and unfit of being the heiress. She was also often being compared with her older cousin who was said to be a prodigy, and her little sister who was even more capable than her. Because of that comparison, she lost even more confidence in herself. Shirahoshi listened to Nara's words carefully. It would be a lie to say that her words didn't hurt her a little bit, because although she and that friend were not 100% similar, but being weak and had no confidence. Wasn't that describing her as well? At her words, Shirahoshi also wondered if her family and her people also thought of her unbefitting of being the princess of this kingdom. Thinking of that possibility, she felt the kind of bitterness that was hard to swallow. Nara continued, but instead of telling her more sad facts about that unknown friend, she put on a big happy smile on her face as she said but later she grew up to be an awesome person. From what I can remember, she was strong enough to use her own strength and power to protect those that she cherished, even with the risk of her own life. Maybe physically, she wasn't as strong as the others, but she certainly had that spirit and the will inside her to train in order to get even stronger. In fact, for me, she was strong because she was able to beat her inner demons and came out as the champion. Shirahoshi was taken aback when Nara suddenly looked up and their eyes met. The mermaid could definitely see the pride, longing, and nostalgia in the ravenette cerulean eyes. You see, Shirahoshi, only by beating your inner demons will you be able to grow and be the person that you want to be. Do you understand what I am trying to say? I, seeing that she wasn't sure, Nero asked instead who are your precious people. My precious people? Shirahoshi asked, blinking her eyes at Nero. The people that you love. The people that you want to protect the most. Her mother's smiling face appeared in her head instantly, but then it was immediately replaced by her mother's pale face as she was struggling to hold on to her last thread of life. I, she clenched her fists. The faces of her father and brothers replaced her mother's. The memories for the past ten years kept on replaying inside her head. She thought of how her family tried their best to keep her safe from the enemy. She remembered the solemn expression on her father's face after the passing of her mother. She watched as her father blamed himself for failing to protect her mother, and that was when Shirahoshi vowed to herself that she would never let her family go through the same experience of losing a loved one again. So she obediently stayed in her tower, growing up to be who she was at the moment. Even though all she ever wanted was to go out there and experience what life could offer, she suppressed her desires and remained quietly in her lonely tower as the others tried their best to protect her. But that wasn't what she wanted at all. Her father's bloodied figure after being beaten cruelly by Hody. The sight of Luffy protected her father and defeated Hody on his own. The sight of the Straw Hats members together with the Neptune army worked together to save the people. And also the glorious battle between Nerechan and the Sea Serpent in order to protect the island. 
All of those events played inside her head and kept reminding her that it wasn't her that saved everyone. It wasn't her that saved her father. It wasn't even her who saved the island. In fact, it was her who became the root of all the problems that happen today. Thinking of it, it made her feel so useless, and she hated it so much. She also wanted to be brave and courageous like the rest of her family and friends. She wanted to protect. She didn't want to just stay quietly on the sideline as everyone else did their best. She wanted to be the worthy princess that was able to protect her people just like how her mother tried her best until her last breath to give a new future for the people, like her father and brothers who never give up on their efforts in providing what was best for the island. And as strong as Nerechan and even Luffy who managed to beat the sea serpent and Hody with their own strength. I want. Nero waited unhurriedly for the other female to collect her thoughts. She was aware of what Shiroho she desired to do but Nero wanted her to say it herself. What? What do you want? I want to protect everyone. Shirahoshi finally said it, but her words were too soft for them to be heard. Nero appeared to be less pleased with that. I can't hear you. Tell me. What exactly do you want to do? Tell me, Princess Shirahoshi. Maybe because of the pressure, or maybe because she was tired trying to suppress herself. But with a burst of determination, Shirahoshi's face turned serious. There was nothing on her face that mirrored her past self as she declared I want to protect everyone. With the words finally out, she felt something inside her that was about to be released. She didn't know what it was, but it made her feel pleasant and comfortable. With her eyes shining brightly, as if she was hit with a sense of enlightenment, she looked at Nero who was taken aback a little bit by the obvious changes in Shirahoshi. Nerechan. I don't want to be left behind and stay as a weakling anymore. I want to protect everyone. I want to protect the island with my own power. Nerechan. Help me. Bewildered, but still feeling satisfied with what she heard, a familiar wide grin appeared on Nera's face. You got it to bail. Also, Vander Decken was completely clueless of what truly happened at the fishman while he was gone. While he was on his way to his destination with the supposed intentions to kill off Shirahoshi and destroy the island, he was actually organizing his own thoughts and plans of what he shall do once he arrived. Even though he and Hody were working together to get rid of King Neptune and take over the Fishman Island, Dekken had never fully believed in that bastard. Just like how Hody was using him, he was also using that bastard to do what he couldn't do alone. Just you wait. For treating me like a little follower of yours, I'll crush you along with that damn island. Dekin declared before he let out a sinister laugh. Yes, he had already planned earlier to kill Hody once the goals were achieved. This was just an act of defense. After all, that Hody was too vicious he would definitely kill him once he was no more useful to him. Before that thing were to happen, he might as well make the first move. While he didn't like to admit it, Dekken knew that he and his crew alone were not enough to take down the whole kingdom by themselves. That was why he was willing to deal with Hody's stupidly arrogant attitude before finish him him. After all, their goals were not exactly the same. While Dekken simply wanted to possess the mermaid princess, he didn't actually care about taking over the island or anything like that. Anyhow, taking over the whole sea sounded way better than taking over a mere island. And with the help of Shirohoshi's legendary ability, it would be as easy as throwing a knife. But the thing was, he couldn't even do anything to get himself closer to her. At first, the obstacle was just her family, but things started to get even more worse when Monkey D. Nera came along and somehow gave Shirahoshi the ability to block his weapons from touching her skin. Because of that woman's presence, he was forced to face the harsh reality that he would never get the chance to possess Shirahoshi for himself if he didn't get rid of Monkey D. Nehru as soon as possible. Hence, the reason why he sought out Hody in the first place. He needed someone else to deal with his biggest obstacle before he could proceed with his plans. He used Hody's big ambitions to take over the island and kill both Monkey D. Nehru and Monkey D. Luffy as bait for him to agree on the temporary alliance. However, Unlike that stupidly arrogant bastard, Dekken wasn't that optimistic about him to succeed that easily. Even though they were deep inside the ocean, he didn't dare to underestimate the strength of the most feared person among the humans above the surface. Not just her, 
but even that brother of her got some nasty reputation as a pirate who dared to go against the world government. While Deccan simply didn't give a damn about the world government, he was also aware of how frighteningly powerful those guys were. That was why he left the island earlier. Whether Hody actually succeeded in his raid or not, he shall see. But considering the situation before he left, Hody seemed to be winning. Especially with his hundreds of sea beasts and the sea serpent. Even Deccan had to admit that no matter how powerful the Yuzakij and the Straw Hats crew on the surface, they too would die once their only bubble of protection was gone. Unless they could breath underwater, which was physically impossible for humans. But little did he know. Once they reached the vicinity of the Fishman Island, what he saw next caused Deccan and his crew to be shocked to their cores. All of them were in a state of disbelief because there was no way the thing that was lying limply on the ocean floor was that sea serpent. And where the heck were the hundreds of sea beasts that were supposed to guard around the island? Did they already raid the island? But how come the island still looked fine? And what in the name of his ancestors happened to the sea serpent while he was gone? With that ugly-looking wound on its body, was it attacked by another sea king, or what? Deccan paused at that thought. Attacked by another sea king? Slowly, a wide smile spread across his face. An image of a certain mermaid flashed across his mind. If that is the case, then. Before he could be overjoyed at his thought, he was interrupted. Captain? Look at that. Someone shouted, and Deccan immediately snapped back into reality. He moved his sight away from the unconscious sea king and looked over at the fishman island. Surprise and disbelief were written all over his face as he stared at that many people that suddenly came out through the entrance of the fishman island. At first a bunch of fishmen and merfolks came out, followed by another group of Neptune army soldiers, and the last group was definitely the one that he recognized with just a glance. How could he not recognize them? It was exactly Shirahoshi and King Neptune whom he thought were supposed to be dead by now. Not only them, but on top of the pet whale that he knew belonged to King Neptune, had a group of humans on its back. There was no mistake. Among them was Monkey D. Neru and Monkey D. Luffy, along with his crew, and they were all being protected by a bubble dome that covered the back of the whale. The sight of them staying in line between the Fishman Island and the ship was clear to see that they had no intention to escape. Instead, they looked ready to clash in a battle. What's going on? Deccan asked, but nobody could respond to his question because his crew was too busy freaking out among themselves. Captain? Bad news. Bad news. There is no response from Captain Hody's side. What should we do, Captain? Let's just run. The situation doesn't look too good here, Captain. With his crew kept saying shits about escaping and abandoning the ship, the captain himself was starting to get annoyed. Shut up, you imbeciles. Deccan finally snapped, making the others shut their mouths instantly. Gritting his teeth in frustration, Deccan glared at the figure of Shirohoshi who had her hands clasped together in a hopeful manner, before staring at the sight of the two people that Hody dreamt to kill. Actually, he wasn't that surprised to see them still alive and well, but he expected something to happen to them at least. Especially that damn woman. Just seeing them was enough proof that Hody clearly hadn't succeeded in what he claimed to do and now suffering his own consequences at the hands of the Yuzikich. With not even a single sea beast in sight, and that sea serpent was still there with an ugly-looking wound on its body and no sign of being conscious, Deccan was now sure more than anything else that something comparable to the sea serpent must had came and attacked it, thus scaring away the other sea beasts. Once it was done, the thing then went away. It was just an assumption on his side. But there was no more explanation that he could come up with other than the Yuzukij managed to kick Hody's ass, and a certain mermaid responsible for the sea serpent's demise. There is no doubt about that. It must be Shirohoshi. Deccan claimed confidently. No matter what the truth was, he already considered his assumptions to be the truths. Thinking that Shirohoshi had truly used her power to call out a seeking to protect the island, he was more determined than ever to get her. And about Hody? Who the heck give a damn about that incompetent loser anyway? It was his own fault for underestimating the enemies. But now that the lousy bastard was gone, 
Deccan now realized that he had to face this problem on his own. What the heck was he supposed to do about these people that looked like they were so ready to attack him? Were they trying to go all out and really going to attack him? Deccan considered the pros and cons in his situation. On the other side, there was a group of angry people that might attack him. Not to mention that there were also powerful figures among them. Maybe he should follow his crew's advice and retreat. Like hell. I have the whole damn ship to destroy the whole damn island. Why would I even be afraid of them who have nothing? And those humans, no matter how powerful they are on land, there is no way they could survive once I destroyed the bubble. Also, that stupid Hody, he was the one who kept bragging about taking over the island and kill Neptune, but now where the fuck is that guy? Useless. I don't care anymore. Shirahoshi will be mine. No matter what it takes, I will make sure to get her for myself. It was good to say that Dekken had finally lost it. His rationality had been taken over by his greed to possess Shirahoshi who possessed the power to communicate with Sea Kings. The event of her crying that managed to summon several Sea Kings ten years ago was still fresh in his memories. And now that he would finally achieve the dreams and goals of his ancestors, why the heck should he give up now? No, he simply wouldn't. Without wasting any more time, he ordered his crew to begin to attack. Hurry! Just attack them! At his words, his followers hurriedly went to take out every weapons like the bombs, firearms, cannonballs, etc. But before they could even touch them, a shadow suddenly loomed over them. Before anyone could point out the unusual thing, something from above suddenly landed itself on the deck of the ship. You! Deccan's eyes turned red with anger when he realized what or who was the unwelcome visitor. It was Fukuboshi who had his signature trident pointed at Deccan. A moment after that, two figures suddenly appeared from above and landed themselves on each of his sides. They were, precisely, Roboshi who had his long swords in his hands and Manboshi who danced his usual dance. It seemed like no matter the situation and the place, the youngest prince would always dance his silly dance out of habit. What are you doing here? He asked with a panicked look on his face. They must have swam here when he was too focused on the people at the island. No wonder he didn't see the three princes among the crowd. He just thought that maybe Hody had killed them earlier or they were just too injured to move or something. Well, obviously that wasn't the case. That Hody is really useless, Deccan thought angrily. Due to the unexpected appearance of the three princes, his crew halted their movements and nervously looked between their captain and the princes. Because of their sizes, they couldn't help but to think that Deccan looked extremely weak standing in front of the big princes. Especially when their captain was showing such an obvious fear on his face, while the princes remained calm and heroic. Vander Deccan. Fukuboshi started with a cold voice. His eyes were hardened, and there was no trace of the little bit of gentleness on his face at all. With the crime of harassing the princess and threatening her life for ten years, and colluding with an enemy with the intention to dethrone the king and destroy the island. We will arrest you, and you shall live the rest of your life in prison. Oh, don't be hasty. Do don't you care about your island anymore? If you don't stop the ship now, then you can say bye-bye to your kingdom. Deccan tried to stall for some time as he slowly took a couple of steps backwards. Anyone could see that despite his ambiguous declarations earlier, facing the three princes now was a total mistake on his part. Who didn't know that the Ryugu brothers were extremely talented in combat? They had been trained by King Neptune himself when it came to physical training. It must be said that one of the main forces that made them undergo various training to get stronger was because of their desire to protect their only sister and to catch Vander Dekken. And now that the enemy was right in front of them, they would definitely not let him go. The ten precious years that had been wasted because of this bastard shall be paid right now. Enough talk. We came here to take you down. The matter of this ship and the island shall be handled by our sister herself. What are you talking about? Deccan asked, confused. He actually got a bad feeling about this. You should know. Fukuboshi responded. After all, the reason why you came for her all these years was because of something that belongs only to her, right? Eyes widened, Deccan gasped in surprise and turned to look at the direction of the princess. Don't tell me, Ark. Captain? 
The crew watched in shock when Fukuboshi suddenly rushed forward and attacked Dekken when he didn't pay attention. Panicked, Dekken, who was now sprawling on the floor after being rammed to the other side of the ship by Fukuboshi, took out a small blade that he had hidden under his sleeve. Then he yelled at his crew, What are you fools waiting for? Attack them! With his command, the flying pirates let out a battle cry and rushed forwards with weapons in hands. Some were carrying swords, some went bare hand, and some stood on their spots with guns and dynamites as they prepared to attack from a distance. Brother! Roboshi called out to the blue-haired merman. For once, the second prince didn't speak using his usual sing-song voice. His eyes turned serious when enemies approached him and his younger brother from his side and he immediately slashed them using his swords. Even Nanboshi, who usually danced happily, didn't utter anything and focused on pushing, punching and blocking away the enemies. Don't worry about me. Fukuboshi replied without looking back at his brothers. His eyes never stopped glaring at his enemy. Leave Vander Dekken to me. You two can handle them. Be careful. With the words from their eldest brother, Roboshi and Nanboshi shared a silent communication through eye contact before nodding their heads. Together, they faced the enemies and didn't even give a single one of them to sneak upon Fukuboshi. With the two princes staying between them and Fukuboshi who managed to intimidate Dekken from moving away, it was impossible for the Flying Pirates members to even bypass the two mermen. Those who tried would only get cut by Roboshi with his long swords or get blown away by Manboshi with his excellent fishman karate. Even without legs, and depending on the bubble float around their waists, it didn't affect their speed at all. We can't get close, shouted one of the pirates. Forget it. Just shoot. And so, the gunners among the crew took out their firearms and were ready to shoot. But before they were able to do so, something big suddenly dropped down from above and landed itself on top of the unsuspecting pirates. The thing turned out to be a sea beast with big and long fins, and long tail that were used to sweep and slap away the dumbstruck members of the flying pirates. Those who were fortunate enough to escape were scared shitless when they saw that a couple more sea beasts of the same species as the first sea beast suddenly showed themselves from outside of the bubble that protected the ship from the seawater. Not only that, among the sea beasts were also the soldiers of the Neptune army. The pirates were not stupid. They knew that these soldiers came to help the princes. It's the Neptune army. Damn it. Just run. The Neptune army soldiers immediately went through the bubble wall and landed themselves on the deck. Help the princes. Capture the criminals. Shouted one of them before attacking the pirates. The others immediately followed after him. The sea beasts that they brought together also played their roles in attacking the pirates. With the help of the Neptune army who came, the members of the flying pirates were instantly subdued and captured. It really wasn't that hard. For the soldiers who had trained themselves meticulously over the years to sharpen their abilities, plus with the experiences of handling a bunch of criminals and so on, the savage and untrained ways of the pirates were not enough for them to escape from the Neptune army. The three princes were quite proud of the army. And the defeat of the crew was all witnessed by the captain himself. The frightened and panicked Vander Dekken who still hadn't moved from his spot couldn't believe his eyes when he saw how easily his crew was defeated just like that. He didn't even expect that instead of running the fuck away, they really had the guts to stay and even planned a counterattack? He regretted it. He really regretted that he didn't escape when he still had the chance. Who would have thought that these people were really not scared at all? Brother, we're done here. Informed the dancing man Boshi. Fukuboshi nodded. Now, about Vanderdecken. Out of desperation of not wanting to be caught after seeing that he was cornered with no other place to run, Dekken threw the blade that he had been holding in his hand towards the surprised Fukuboshi who was taken aback by Dekken's sudden move. He immediately deflected the incoming blade with his trident. But the blade was proven to be just a simple diversion when Dekken suddenly threw multiple smoke bombs between them, and the place immediately covered by smoke. Brother! Prince Fukuboshi! When the smoke finally cleared away, only the coughing Fukuboshi was seen. There was no sight of Dekken around him, and Fukuboshi immediately cursed. Over there. Vander Dekken was over there. 
When they looked over, they were greeted with the sight of Vanderdecker who was riding the back of a fish that was a little bit bigger than his size. Unlike a moment ago, this time he was wearing the bubble suit that he often wore to protect himself from the seawater. Fukuboshi with his keen eyes instantly noticed the item that he recognized as one of those things that were used to make bubbles. At once, he understood that Dekken was using a simple distraction to stall for some time so that he could escape by making himself a bubble suit, and jumped through the bubble wall of the ship riding on the back of the fish that Fukuboshi realized had been lingering around the ship even before he and his brothers arrived. Once a sneaky bastard, always a sneaky bastard, he thought. Akamanbua! He's running away! Manboshi exclaimed. Princes! Don't worry! We will go and chase after him now, declared one of the soldiers, and the others were ready to go out there and chase after the wanted criminal, but Fukuboshi stopped them before they could go. No need to go, all of you, he said. Are we letting him go then? Roboshi asked with narrowed eyes as he glared at the figure of their enemy that was gradually getting smaller as the distance grew. Even though he was surprised that his brother didn't let the Neptune army to chase after Dekken, he trusted his brother. Fukuboshi was not the type of person to make a reckless decision, and he was proven right when the blue-haired merman handed his trident over to him. I will deal with him myself, Fukuboshi simply said. The others didn't try to stop him and only watched in anticipation as he went through the bubble wall. But instead of swimming after Dekken, Fukuboshi only stayed still. They wondered what it was that he was going to do. Fukuboshi ignored the look of everyone and kept his eyes on his target. Getting into the stance that he was so familiar with, he gathered a lot of water between his palms, until a spiraling water vortex was formed. With a look of extreme concentration, he then thrust his palms towards the direction of the escaping pirate. Immediately, the spiraling water that he had gathered was shot forward. Amazingly, as it was shot forward, it turned into a form that resembled a long creature with four limbs that the humans would recognize as a dragon. The Neptune army gaped in amazement at the sight. To think that Prince Fukuboshi has already mastered the merman combat to this level. It is truly great. It should be said that there weren't that many merfolks who were able to use the infamous merman combat as well as King Neptune. So seeing another merman that was able to execute such an outstanding move was truly a sight. And that merman was none other than their own future ruler. And that shot wasn't just a simple water shot like Hody or Jean Bay had shown before either. Instead of a small water shot, this was truly using all the water around him to his advantage. If that attack hit Dekken, he would not be able to escape. With great anticipation, everyone watched as the raging water shot made its way with a great speed towards Dekken, who had belatedly realized that something was chasing after him from behind. Turning his head to look behind was a mistake because when he saw the incoming view of a huge creature with its mouth wide open ready to swallow him, he actually froze in fear instead of telling his fish to swim faster or even dodge to the side. Instead, his mind went blank as he stared fearfully at the incoming attack. W.H. W.H. what? Failing to react in time, the attack from Fukuboshi finally hit him. Fukuboshi only watched as his water attack swallowed Dekken's whole figure, and the bubble suit that protected him burst into nothingness. The fish managed to escape once the burden left its back, but unfortunately for Dekken who was a devil fruit user, he could only watch in horror as he failed to move his body. The harsh current of the water dragged his body further away into the dark abyss of the ocean where no light could reach, and his body disappeared from view. At the same time, the ship fell, causing those on board the ship to panic. Only Raboshi and Manboshi remained calm. Fukuboshi, who didn't want to care about the fate of Vanderdecken, turned his attention to his little sister. Shirahoshi, you can do it. At the same time. Arg, the ship is falling. Chopper, who sat on Frankie's shoulder, exclaimed nervously. Neru hide, and Luffy along with his crew were staying protected inside the bubble on the back of the whale whose name was Ho. King Neptune and Shirohoshi were joined by the available citizens and the Neptune army as they stayed in line and watched the incoming ship. This was their way of showing that no matter what would happen, they would stay loyal to their kingdom, causing Nerit to like them even more and more. 
The three princes were supposed to sneak into the ship first without being noticed by the enemies. Once they showed themselves to Vanderdecken, the ready Neptune army would then go ahead to assist them in the obviously one-sided battle. Luffy and Zoro wanted to join, but unexpectedly, they just stood quietly next to Nehru, much to the surprise of the whole crew. They all watched as Fukuboshi's group managed to defeat the flying pirates and became nervous when Vanderdecken tried to escape via a sneaky way. But much to the pride of King Neptune, Fukuboshi was seen showing an impressive display of his ability as he managed to manipulate the water and shot what looked like the knocked-out sea serpent, but with limbs. Needless to say, Nehru and the Straw Hats were impressed. Following the defeated Dekken as he was dragged by the ocean's current to who nowhere, his ability was obviously cancelled when the ship was starting to fall. But even though the people were obviously nervous and in a panic mode, they didn't move or even attempt to do anything. Instead, they looked at Shirahoshi who had her eyes closed and her hands clasped together over her chest. They didn't know what to expect or even know what went through in the princess's head, but they all knew that she was trying her best to save the ship. The only question was, how was she going to accomplish that? Their curiosity was then answered in an unexpected but magical way when the princess's whole body was shrouded in light. It was bright, but not bright enough to make them look away. In fact, all of them were mesmerized and found it hard to look away. Even Nero couldn't hide the surprise on her face when she sensed the pure energy that suddenly emerged from Shirahoshi. Kurama, this dashed before she could finish her words, her senses were telling her that multiple presences were detected and they were heading this way. It wasn't just her who could sense it. Luffy, Zoro and Sanji who could use Kenbunchu Kahaki were alarmed and all three of them stared at where Nero was looking. But among them, Luffy was the one who acted all strange as he said Nechan. I can hear some people saying weird things. Nero wanted to ask what he meant by that, but missed her chance when Usopp suddenly yelled. Look at that. Sea Kings. True to his words, Sea Kings started to show up. The people of the Fishman Island were surprised. But not in a bad way. Instead, a flash of realization could be seen in their eyes as they stared at the Sea Kings that came in different looks and shapes before staring at their princess. Their princess summoned the Sea Kings. What a great surprise. Shirahoshi finally opened her eyes. The light disappeared as soon as she unclasped her hands and held her father's arm as a support, while King Neptune looked at her in concern. Shirahoshi, are you feeling unwell, Jaman? And no, father. I'm fine. She was telling the truth. Like the rest, she too was surprised at the incoming Sea Kings. She was just feeling overwhelmed because her voice was heard and they actually came upon her request. At the thought of how much she hoped, prayed, begged and even yelled internally for the Sea Kings to hear her voice, Shirahoshi teared up a little bit. But since she was in the water, nobody could see the tears. Unconsciously, she turned her gazes over to Nehru and was happy when the older woman gave her a comforting smile and a look of pride. Gaining more confidence, Shirahoshi brushed away the remaining doubt in her heart and shouted. My friends, can you hear me? Her sudden act of shouting caused the people who didn't understand what was going on to look at her in confusion, especially the straw hats. Even Nero was confused and curious to know if Shirahoshi was truly having a conversation with those seekings just like how she talked to Kurama. As all of them focused on the princess and the seekings, nobody noticed the way Luffy was looking around in confusion before staring intensely at the seekings. This time, he didn't say anything about the weird things that he experienced at the moment. Is that her? That's really her. Finally, after hundreds of years, she finally appeared. Our queen. Listening to the many voices that nobody else but her were able to hear, Shirahoshi's lips trembled. Help me. The ship. And Noah. Too full of emotions, Shirahoshi couldn't convey what she truly wanted to say properly but the Sea Kings understood. Please do not worry. We will help. After all, that is our duty. To help you. Our Queen. The Sea Kings that came then used their mouth to grab the chains that were attached to the ship, before bringing the ship to where the sea forest was located with a most gentleness. Shirahoshi was so happy that she really burst into tears on the spot. Because she really did it. 
she embraced her true self and used the ability that she was forced to hide to prove herself. While everyone was cheering and praising the princess and princes for what they had done, nobody realized that a pair of green eyes were opened and stared at the crying princess in shock. The sea serpent who was momentarily conscious at the moment was thinking of another figure from distant memories. In those memories, a mermaid was seen rubbing its head affectionately as she said in a soft voice, I'm sorry, but I couldn't leave him just yet. Please bring this back to our home. Thank you, I hope in my next life we will meet again, my friend. And the sea serpent closed its eyes again, unaware that another pair of eyes were watching him and managed to capture the mixed emotions that could be seen in its eyes a moment ago. Interesting, Robin thought.